Before watching please like share and subscribe. Naruto was panting as he felt extreme pain in his shoulder. He stood across from Sasuke Uchiha a traitor to his village. Naruto along with his friends Chiji Akamichi, Kiba Inazuka, Niji Hyuga, a recently added Rock Lee and Shikamaru Nara had been charged with the duty to bring him back to village before he went to Orochimaru an S-class trader to his village. The chase lead them to the valley of the end. The valley was a large lake with a waterfall and two large statues of the Shodame Hokage Hashirama Senju and Madara Uchiha. Both of them were the founders of the village of Kanoha, the home of both Naruto and Sasuke. Naruto who was wrapped in a cloak of red chakra with elongated fangs and claw glared at Sasuke. Sasuke currently had gray skin with purple hair with a black mark on his face. The whites of his eyes were black while the eyes were purple. On his back he had two large hands that seemed to act like wings. Sasuke, Naruto growled, don't do this. You can still come back. Why should I go back? Sasuke growled as he focused chakra into his hand, I'm not going back to that weak village, it will only hold me back from my real power. Naruto growled and focused chakra into his hand as well. Both had different reactions. Sasuke's was mostly electric and all over the place and was white until it grew slightly larger and turned silver. Naruto's was more contained and formed a ball of spinning chakra that looked like it could do some damage. The two jumped forward and called out their attacks. Sasuke, Chidori. Naruto, Rasengan. The two attacks collided and the result was a large burst of chakra that shook the ground around them. The chakra merged and formed a large ball of chakra that then promptly exploded. The two then fell to the ground. Sasuke reverted to his normal self as did Naruto. Got, you, team, Naruto groaned as he lost consciousness. Sasuke didn't say anything as the backlash from the technique had knocked him right out. As the two lay asleep they weren't aware of the presence above them. Suddenly a green light came down from the sky and lifted Naruto up into the sky. Then there was a loud boom and then silence. That was the scene that a man with gravity, defying silver hair, his headband, pulled over his eye came to. His name was Kakashi Hitaki, and he was supposed to be the sensei for Naruto, Sasuke, and their third teammate Sakura Haruno, who will be seen later on. Kakashi looked around and saw Sasuke, but Naruto was nowhere to be seen. Kakashi leaned down and picked up Sasuke and hefted him over his shoulder. Kakashi, Pakan, Kakashi's dog summon asked, shouldn't we look for Naruto? Kakashi mentally undid the summoning after that. Kakashi, like most of the village, hated Naruto. Years ago, the village was attacked by the Kyubi no Kitsune, the strongest of the nine demon lords. Unfortunately, Naruto had it sealed inside him by the fourth Hokage, Minato Namikaze. Since then Naruto has been hated by the villagers save for a select few. Kakashi had been Minato's student, so he didn't like Naruto either. When he was supposed to be guarding Naruto, he let Naruto get beaten. When he was supposed to be training him, he went off to train Sasuke. The council wanted him to train Sasuke since they would use him to avenge the Yandame that Naruto murdered. Yes they do see him as the QB. Really are these people idiots or what? Meanwhile outside the Earth's atmosphere. A large ship floated just outside the Earth's gravitational pull. It was large and made of black metal. It had two large green orbs on the sides on the back. The front was split in two and had a green orb on top part and the bottom. Right before where the ship splits is a green circle that has the symbol of a black hourglass shape in it. Green electricity sparked between the two halves. Think how Vilgax's ship looks only black and green. Inside Naruto lay still on a table. He was currently inside a laboratory. On the far left of the room was a large computer that had information on it written in a language that looked like gibberish. On the other side was a large thing of mechanical tools and other equipment. Above Naruto was large machine that was currently shut down so it was hard to tell what it was for. Beside him a round platform rose up. On it stood a very tiny organism. It was small enough for a baby to pick up and play with. 
It had a gray body, seemed to have a beard growing out of its chin and walked around with a metal cane, indicating that it was old. His eyes were green and large and far apart. The pupil was rectangular shape. What this creature lacked in size, though it made up for in brains. It was a galvan. Its kind was one of the smartest in the universe. The galvan looked over Naruto. After a few minutes, the blonde stirred. Oh man, Naruto groaned, can someone get the number of the train that hit me? Naruto looked around and saw the fact that he was in some kind of lab. He jumped up and yelled, Okay Aroki team, come out, so I can kick your slimy, white, pedo dash. Calm yourself child, said an old voice, that Naruto could see, over here boy. Naruto looked to his side and gasped in shock at the tiny creature. What in the heck are you? Naruto yelled. I am a Galvan, the creature said, you can call me Merlin. Okay Merlin, Naruto asked still on edge, why am I here? Relax boy, Merlin said, I brought you here cause I have had my eye on you for a while. For what exactly? Naruto asked. He was still a little wary. My experiment, the small creature said. Naruto immediately started freaking. And away, the blonde yelled, I'm not being some guinea pig. Child, Merlin said with a slightly impatient tone, calm down and let me explain. Do you want something to eat? This is going to be a long story. Naruto, still wary, nodded. Merlin hit a button and a small tray holding sandwich, some chips, a salad and a glass of milk appeared next to Naruto and floated toward him. Naruto picked up the sandwich and ate rather slowly as the alien started his story. For starters, Merlin said, I am not of this world. I am an alien. In this galaxy alone, called the Milky Way, there are over a million alien species existing along with your species. Naruto looked shock, but decided not to interrupt. My species are called the Galvan, one of the most intelligent beings out there. I am but a humble scientist who simply wants to make his mark on the universe. How do you plan on doing that? Naruto asked. That started years ago, Merlin said gaining a slightly sad tone. On my home, Galvan Prime, my brother Azimuth, created a device that could allow one being to take the form of any being that had its DNA in it. He called it the Omnitrix. Me and my brothers were rivals in a sense. I decided to try and create my own device. However instead of striving to make a device, I decided to try and create the ultimate life form. Unfortunately, I needed DNA samples from many creatures. I had to use blood samples since blood contains many strains of one's DNA. Sadly, the Galvan High Council found my samples and assumed the worst. As a result, I was banished. Whoa, Naruto said, what happened? Once off planet I was no longer limited, Merlin said, I collected samples from being outside the Milky Way. After a few years of researching I managed to find the right way to do it. All that was left was to find a subject. Me? Naruto asked as he crunched on his chips. Yes, Merlin answered, I have scanned this galaxy for someone who could handle the strain of the experiment. I've seen your regenerative powers. That should allow you to handle the stress. I don't know about this, Naruto said as he drank his milk, I'm not too keen on the idea of being an experiment. What if I can't go home? What about my friends? Naruto, Merlin said, I know that this seems like a difficult change, but it will be for the better. You will have powers that some of the people on your planet can only dream off. Plus you will be able to fight for your friend and protect them. Really? Naruto asked as he heard that. Yes, Merlin said smiling, I guarantee it. Okay then, Naruto said, what's going to happen? Do I get something slapped on my wrist or something? No exactly, Merlin said, my experiment means you'll be injected with the blood of the aliens directly. You will be what holds the power not a device. Um won't the injections hurt? Naruto asked. He had a slight fear of needles. Since he was a kid some doctors in the hospital tried to poison him. Not to mention one went psycho and stabbed a bunch of hypodermic needles into his back and tried to poison him. Luckily an ANBU with a weasel mask came to save him. 
Guess who? Merlin knew of his unease. He had seen what the village had done to him and knew the reason behind his fear. You will be unconscious for the length of the procedure. You may feel a little bit of pain, but you will not die, the Galvin said making Naruto sigh in relief. Okay little man, Naruto said making Merlin sweat drop, let's do this. Naruto laid back on the metal slab and syringe, came out of the table and injected Naruto with a sedative. He yelped in pain, but lost consciousness a few seconds later. The machine above Naruto suddenly whirred to life. Large metal arms came out along. A large box came from the nearby wall. One of the arms reached to it and took out a vial that contained blood in it. Beginning injection sequence, said a computerized voice. Meanwhile, in the seal. Hubi woke up from his nap as he felt something strange in his container's body. What the hell? Hubi asked to no one in particular. Suddenly, he felt an extreme pain and his container. Oh boy, the fox yelled as it sent out some of its chakra to heal any damage. Outside the seal, Merlin noticed a red glow that covered Naruto's body. It was then he noticed that his body was also healing slightly faster. He grinned as he had been right. As the procedure went on his platform rose up and flew over to a small round orb. He pressed a button on the console and the orb rose up and flew toward the airlock which opened closed and the outer door to it opened and it flew out. The drone flew down toward towards the planet below and suddenly covered itself up in head metal plates and flew through the Earth's atmosphere. The orb crashed into the ground. After a few seconds of sitting in the crater the plates retracted and it flew off towards its destination. Meanwhile, in Kanoha. A tall busty blonde woman with a blue diamond on her forehead was sitting at her desk. Her name was Tsunade Senju the Godame of Kanoha. There were tear stains on her face as she recalled what happened a few hours earlier. Flashback she, along with many other people, stood at the gate of Kanoha waiting for Naruto and Sasuke to return. After about an hour Kakashi came into view with Sasuke on his shoulder. Unfortunately, Naruto was nowhere to be seen. Kakashi, Tsunade called out, where's Naruto? I couldn't find him, Kakashi lied, I looked all over, but there was no sign of him anywhere. I knew that Baka would get killed, said Sakura Haruno, Naruto's other teammate. She was die-hard Uchiha fangirl. She spat on Naruto, since he contained the QB, and because she thought it would get her points, with Sasuke. She is so going to get hurt. Why you shouldn't essay such tea things, said the timid voice of Hinata Huga. So what? Sakura asked, he probably ran off after he got beaten by Sasuke Kuen. I should have known he would go traitor, that worthless Baka. Hinata broke character for a brief second and glared at the back of the pink-haired girl's head. Tsunade was upset. Hell she was on the verge of tears. She walked off and ran to her office, before her tears began to fall. She loved the blonde like a son, and now, he was gone. She had been in her office, and cried for a while. End flashback. Tsunade was pulled from her memories when there was a tapping at her window. She turned to see a floating black orb. She cautiously approached the window and opened it. The orb floated to where it was in front of her desk. It opened up to reveal a projector. It hummed to life and the image of a strange creature appeared. He had gray skin, a beard, an elongated forehead and wide green eyes that had rectangular pupils. Who are you? Tsunade asked, with extreme curiosity. My name is Merlin, the projected creature said, I am called a Galvin, but more to the point I know where the Uzumaki boy is. What? Tsunade asked, where? With me, the projection said, he is willing to become part of my experiment. What experiment? the busty Kage asked. You will see in due time, the projection said with a grin, but first I suggest you not tell anyone of this. The last thing we need is information like this leaking out. The blonde nodded and the projection faded. The orb closed and shot out the still open window. Tsunade sat in thought. She had a feeling that when the blonde came back that things would be very insane. Back in Merlin's ship. Naruto stirred. 
He groaned slightly as he felt some pain from all the injections. He rose up and found a brace on his arm that looked very complex. Hey Merlin, Naruto called gaining the Galvin's attention, what is this? Well, Merlin explained, until you gain mastery over your powers you will have to wear that so you don't have to worry about your DNA becoming unstable and falling apart. The blonde paled and almost fainted. So how am I supposed to master my powers? Naruto asked. Practice of course, Merlin said, from what I estimate it will take about 1,200 years to master your power. 1,200 years? Naruto yelled. Easy child, Merlin said, an effect of the operation allows your body to regenerate aged cells. In essence, boy, you now have eternal youth. I'm eternally young? Naruto asked, oh man I'm going to look like this for the rest of my life. Actually no, Merlin said, you will retain the same looks when you are about 16 or so. Given how you will age during training, you should be quite the ladies' magnet. Oh man, Naruto groaned, I'm going to have fangirls. Now, Merlin said, getting Naruto out of his funk, follow me. The platform Merlin was on rose up and hovered out of the door to the lab. The two then went through this ship, which, to Naruto, seemed like a maze. Eventually, they reached what looked like a large safe. This, Merlin said, pointing to the machine, is a hyperbolic time chamber. In here time moves, much slower. One year and there is one day out here. I'm going to train in here? Naruto asked. Yes, Merlin said, there are multiple machines that will be able to train you to utilize your powers. In addition, I also managed to get this. He pressed a button on a console and a glowing blue cube about half his size came out. This is called a holocron, Merlin said as Naruto stared at the small cube, in it I have stored the world's jutsu, as you call them. I managed to pick these up via my scanning drones. You will train with these, also. Cool, Naruto said. Now boy, Merlin said, let your training begin. The door to the chamber opened and Naruto stepped in. See you later, old timer, Naruto said, making Merlin sweat drop. See you in a few years, boy, Merlin said as the door closed. As the door closed, he chuckled, I like that boy. Inside the time chamber. Naruto looked around at the large empty space that would serve as his training area. He noticed that there were an abundance of machines that were supposed to be helping him train. He noticed a small dwelling area with a bed, a table with chairs, a refrigerator, and a shower. A uh, hello? Naruto yelled. Suddenly the machines came to life. They all looked at the blonde who looked a little bit nervous. Subject, Naruto Uzumaki. Training protocol commence. Outside the chamber, Merlin sat down and grabbed a cup of, what the earthlings call, tea. He had to admit that it was a very nice drink for something made on a backwater planet. He heard explosions fro inside the chamber and knew that Naruto had started his training. He grinned as he heard them. He knew that the ultimate life form was well under its way to completion. For the next three years, Naruto trained in the hyperbolic time chamber. While inside he figured out the special abilities of shadow clones. The memories were sent back to the original upon dispersing. Unfortunately, Naruto overused it once and wound up with the mother of all migraines. This also helped him when he learned the jutsu from the holocron. It didn't speed up his training in his alien powers, however, since most of them were physical and muscle memory didn't transfer. He had also become more logical over training as well. His crush on Sakura died. Why go after a girl who follows some stuck-up jerk around like a lost puppy? He had also grown to dislike Sasuke. He used to see Sasuke as a brother, but he got out of that. What kind of brother drives an assassination technique through your chest? Hubie also played a role in his training. The fox decided, since Naruto knew the secrets of shadow clones, he decided to teach him some demonic jutsu as well as some other things. Now in the hyperbolic time chamber a one figure stood amongst rubble and destroyed robots and machines. He was about six feet tall with spiky blonde hair. He had an athletic build that was seen though the training outfit he wore. It was black jumpsuit with white armor covering his chest with white boots and gloves. 
Imagine the armor Vegeta wore during the fight with Frieza on Namek. His face was devoid of baby fat and the whisker marks were faded. This was Naruto Uzumaki. On his back was large black sword. It stood about as tall as he was and had the image of a scorpion at the bottom of the blade. Right where the blade met the hilt it formed a dark-looking skull and two claws came out of the sides of the hilt. Naruto brought the sword to his arm where it was sealed into a tattoo that was the kanji for scorpion. The blonde walked towards the door which was recently unlocked. He opened the door and stepped out. He grinned as he saw Merlin sitting across from him. The Galvan hadn't really changed in the centuries Naruto had been gone. Hyperbolic time chamber remember? Hey there old man, Naruto said making the Galvan groan. You can't call me that, Merlin said, you're much older than me now. Yeah, Naruto said, good point, shrimp. The Galvan growled then he noticed a tattoo on his arm. What is that, he asked. Oh something from the fox, Naruto said, turns out he's not that bad, he taught me some demonic jutsu and he gave me this sword. It was wielded by Scorpio a demon knight. He was killed by some other knight named Sparta. Fox also told me about my parents, which means I'm going to have some choice words when I go back. So you have a demonic weapon, Merlin said, then I hope you don't mind me adding two more things to your arsenal. The platform Merlin was on floated over to a table that had a cloth over it. Merlin grasped the sheet in his tiny hands and tore off the sheet. Naruto felt his eyes widen as he beheld two swords. The first was obviously made on earth. It was large katana. Its blade was black while the handle was white and had a diamond pattern on it. On the blade was the kanji for fire, water, earth, wind, and lightning. The second one was alien-made. It was basically a large Zanbato-like weapon. The handle was brown due to being wrapped in leather. The blade itself didn't seem to be anything special, but at the bottom of the blade it had a green circle that had a black hourglass symbol on it. What are these? Naruto asked. Weapons to help you, Merlin said, the first is the elemental blade. Focus your chakra into the kanji seals and the element is shot out of the blade. The second one is one of my making. If you focus the blade shines with energy and can enable you to cut through the toughest of metals. I call it the Omni Sword. Not really original, but it makes sense. Whoa, Naruto said, I think I'm going to seal these up with my other sword. Naruto reached into a AG and took out a think for making tattoos. He drew one for elemental and another for alien. Both of which held different spots on his arm. Sting, the one he got from QB, was sealed in his forearm. The elemental blade was sealed into his upper arm and the Omni Sword was sealed in the top of his hand. Now then, Merlin said, as Naruto finished sealing his swords, I have some new clothes you can use. Come get me when you're done changing. Merlin's platform floated out of the room to give Naruto some privacy. Naruto found the clothes and put them on. A few minutes later, Naruto came out wore black baggy jeans and ANBU-style sandals. His shirt was blue. He wore a white trench coat that had the Omnitrix symbol on the back and green flames on the back. The trench coat also had its sleeves torn off allowing Naruto free movement. To cover his tattoos he found a pair of white fingerless gloves to cover the one on his hand he decided to keep his upper arms bare since he didn't want to look too ridiculous. He left the room and found Merlin waiting for him. Naruto, Merlin said, before you leave I want you to do something for me. Okay, Naruto said, what is it? My little brother's device, the Omnitrix, is in the hands of a 15-year-old boy named Ben Tennyson, Merlin explained. I want you to fight him and see which of you is stronger. Okay, Naruto said, I wanted to test my powers on someone strong anyway. Good, Merlin said, you'll drop down and find him. He usually hangs out at some place, called the Groovy Smoothie right about now. Got it, Naruto said. The blonde walked into a pod and the door closed. The pod was then launched from the ship. Naruto held on for dear life as the pod shook, meaning it had just entered the atmosphere. The pod then had three large fins come out and start spinning like propellers. 
This was obviously meant to slow down the approach. Meanwhile, three teens sat at a table at the groovy smoothie. One wore a black shirt with a green jacket that had a white stripe on one side with the number 10. He wore blue jeans and white sneakers. He had brown hair and green eyes. On his wrist was a watch-like device that looked rather complicated. The second was a girl. She was 15 like the other boy. She wore a red shirt with a black vest and blue jeans with boots. Her hair was red and drawn up in a ponytail. The third and obviously the oldest in the group was tall and muscular. He had on blue jeans and black muscle shirt. Over a long sleeve gray shirt. His hair was cut short and his eyes were piercing. In order, they were Ben Tennyson, Gwen Tennyson, and Kevin Levin. Ben took a large gulp of his smoothie. He was silent for a moment, then he let out a loud belch. Ben, Gwen scolded, that's disgusting. Come on Gwen, Ben said, it's not like there's no one around to hear me burp or anything. Besides, Kevin said, it's not like there's anything else to do. Alien activity has been on an all-time low. Plus, I'm still sore from when you stuck me in that pod. He was referring to when Ben Gwen and a few others stuck him in a pod to drain some energy out of him. A few months earlier, he had touched Ben's device, called the Ultimatrix. In so, he became a chimera-like monster made up of different parts of the aliens in Ben's device. He had done so to stop a monster named Egregor, who wanted to take the infinity power and use it to take over the universe. They had tracked him and tried to reason with him, but he didn't really comply. After a while, they managed to catch him and turn him back to normal. Sorry man, Ben said, but at least you aren't dead. Point taken, Kevin said. At that moment a beeping was heard. All three turned to see the Ultimatrix beeping. The device then spoke in Ben's voice. Warning, the thing said, alien escape pod, located entering Earth's atmosphere, Lock Atten, two miles due west. Let's go, Ben said as they piled into Ben's car and drove off. A little later the three arrived at the crash site, which turned out to be in a canyon, just outside of town. They looked in curiosity at the alien pod. Slowly the pod opened and to their surprise a human stepped out. He was tall and was muscled. His hair was spiky and jutted out in multiple directions. His eyes were a deep cerulean blue that shone brightly in the sun. He had on black baggy jeans with black sandals, a blue shirt and a white trench coat that had the Omnitrix symbol on the back and green flame on the bottom. He also had on white fingerless gloves and bandages around his forearms. He also had a strange symbol on his upper left arm. Gwen couldn't help but blush slightly as she saw the boy's face. Kevin noticed this and growled silently. The boy shook his head and looked around and found the three teens. Which one of you is Ben Tennyson? the blonde asked. That would be me, Ben said, and you are? Naruto Uzumaki, the blonde answered. That's a weird name, Kevin said. You're one to talk Levin, Naruto said making Kevin growl. So what do you want? Ben asked. Simple, Naruto said, I want to fight you. The three were taken aback by what the boy wanted. Kevin recovered first and grinned, placing his hand on the ground, he activated his powers and absorbed some of the ground into his body turning him into rock. Sorry buddy, Kevin said, but if you fight Ben, you fight us too. Gwen recovered next and lit up her energy. Naruto grinned a fox-like smile at her and said, Listen pretty lady, I don't want to hurt such a pretty face, so why don't you just lower those hands? Gwen's entire face turned red as he said this. Kevin growled again and charged at Naruto. The bloat was ready, however, and dodged the boy's punch. He then followed it up with a strong punch of his own. The result was Kevin, crying out in pain. He back up and Gwen and Kevin gasped as the saw spider web of cracks in Kevin's stone body. Kevin was distracted with this as well and then got nailed in the side of the head by a kick thrown out by the blonde in front of him. Kevin was sent flying and crashed into a tree. Kevin! Gwen yelled and ran over to her fallen boyfriend. Naruto shook his head. Then there was a green flash. 
Naruto turned to see in Ben's place was a large tiger-like creature that had a large spike coming off its wrist. It stood twice as tall as he did. Naruto noticed the Omnitrix symbol in the middle of its chest. Wrath, the tiger man yelled. You want to play big man? Naruto asked throwing off his trench coat showing that he had a lot of muscle. Gwen blushed again and had to avoid having a nosebleed. Come on then. Naruto yelled. With that the two charge at each other. Wrath rose his massive arms and brought them down on Naruto's head. The blonde skillfully dodged and took a shot at Rath's legs. The tiger man roared in pain and fell to one knee. The blonde then spun on his heel and nailed the angry creature's head, sending him flying a few feet away. Gore, Rath snarled, is that all you got little man? You wish for ball, Naruto said. The blonde disappeared at that moment then reappeared right in front of Rath. Then, he sent a strong uppercut to the alien's chin. Wrath was sent flying upwards. Before Naruto could follow up, Kevin came back. He snuck up from behind Naruto with a fresh coat of rock skin. He shifted his arm into a mace. Naruto could sense him however and front flipped to avoid getting torn apart by the large spikes. Now who's laughing? Kevin asked. Me still, Naruto said as he reached for his upper arm. Kevin rose and eyebrow in confusion, but it quickly turned to shock as Naruto pulled a sword out of the tattoo on his arm. It was a sleek elegant looking katana with five strange letter written on it. Now how did this go? Naruto asked, oh right. Kenjutsu, earth style, seismic slam. Naruto focused his chakra into the symbol for earth. The sword glowed a dull green before he brought it up and slammed it on the ground. The result was a huge seismic wave being sent at Kevin. Kevin was too shocked to react. It was obvious since he was then sent flying into the wall of the canyon. Kevin's rock. Armor broke and he lost consciousness. Kevin! Gwen called out. Naruto shook his head and said, I actually expected better from you. Naruto was brought out of his musings by a fist nailing him in the back of the head. The blonde was sent rolling. When he stopped, he was slightly dazed. He turned to see Rath smirking victoriously. So much for Mr. Super Blonde, Rath laughed. Oh yeah? Naruto asked as he focused his chakra again, this time into the lightning symbol. Kenjutsu, lightning style, lightning fury. The blonde swung his sword that was now glowing a light blue. Then bolts of lightning shot off the sword. Wrath was quick to react and managed to avoid. He looked behind him to see that the canyon wall now had a huge hole in it. Don't tell me that's all the famous Ben 10 has, Naruto taunted. Oh now you've gone and made Wrath mad. Wrath growled. He reached for the symbol on his chest. Naruto rose and eyebrow thinking he was going to change forms. Then Wrath turned the dial and the last thing Naruto expected to happen happened. Green energy spread all around Wrath. His fur turned black with white stripes. Spines came out of his back and he now had three spikes coming off his hands. In addition, he had clawed fingers and clawed toes. Ultimate Wrath, the creature roared. Ultimate Wrath charged swinging his claws. Naruto moved quickly and blocked each swipe with his sword. It was good thing he had plenty of time training otherwise he would be chopped liver at the moment. Hold still, so I can slice you, Ultimate Wrath growled, growing easily more frustrated by the moment. Sorry, Naruto said, but I like to be in one piece. Ultimate Wrath growled and kept swinging. Naruto jumped back and Ultimate Wrath charged. The two then engaged in a grappling contest. You may be fast, Ultimate Wrath grinned, but you're not strong enough to go toe to toe in a wrestling match with me. To Ultimate Wrath's surprise Naruto, kept it up. Then an even bigger shock came when he started to push back. How are you able to do that? Ultimate Wrath asked getting a fox-like grin from Naruto. You'll figure it out, Naruto said with his eyes glowing green. Then he fired green lasers from his eyes nailing Ultimate Wrath in the chest. Ultimate Wrath turned back into Wrath and then back into Ben. That was a sneaky trick, Ben said. 
Never said I was going to pay fair, Naruto said, now take another form. I want to see what else you can do. Okay then, Ben said taking out the Ultimatrix. He messed with the dial until he picked one. He slammed down on the top and there was a flash of green light. When it faded it showed a huge yellow armadillo-like creature with a gray tail and what looked like drills in its arms. The whole thing looked like a giant robot. Armadillo, it yelled. Cool, Naruto said putting his sword back. Meanwhile, Gwen was watching and was surprised at the power this guy had. It was then that she decided to call for backup. She took out her plumber's badge and activated the radio in it. A little ways away, at warehouse. A bunch of teens sat. One was a girl that was blue and seemed to have a helmet attached to her head. One male was red with four arms and four yellow eyes. A third was tan with black hair with a white stripe going through it. He also had multiple thorn-like parts coming off him. The last two were the most normal-looking. The first was an African-American male with black hair. He wore a white shirt and jeans. The other was a tall muscular blonde wearing a white shirt with a purple shirt with a number on it in yellow and shorts. Hey, said a voice as an old man in a Hawaiian shirt walked in, who wants some of my famous octopus burgers? Before the teens could answer there was a beeping noise. Thanking whoever was calling they ran to a computer that the beeping was coming from. They pulled up an image and Gwen appeared on it. Hey Gwen, the blonde said. Hey Cooper, said Gwen, listen I don't have time to talk we got a problem. What kind of problem? The red man, named Manny asked. This guy came along in an escape pod and challenged Ben, Gwen said, right now, he and Ben are fighting along with Kevin. So what's the problem? The blue girl named Helen asked. They're losing. Gwen said, badly. The image switched to an image of Naruto putting the beat down on Armadrillo. After a few punches he grabbed Armadrillo's head and threw him into the canyon wall. The teens and old man in the room gasped in shock. We'll be right there, the old man said. Hurry Grandpa Max, Gwen said, there's no telling how much longer those two can hold out. Then got into a large RV and drove off toward the canyon. Back at the canyon, Naruto was dodging electric blasts from a large crab-like alien with a large cranium. Ben adequately called this alien brainstorm. Naruto got sick of dodging and sent his own mental shockwave. The two blasts clashed and eventually exploded. What in the devil's name are you? Brainstorm asked. Complicated, Naruto answered. The blonde then reached for the bandages on his arm. He undid them to reveal a symbol much like the one he had on his upper arm only different. He reached for it and pulled out Sting. What is that butter knife? Brainstorm asked. It's no butter knife you oversized seafood platter, Naruto said may I introduce the second of my weapons, Sting. As soon as he said, Sting the eyes on the scorpion glowed bright purple. Naruto charged and Brainstorm narrowly avoided getting his head cut in half. Brainstorm may have been a crab, but he was fast. The crab man's head opened to reveal his brain and fired another lightning bolt. Naruto slammed his sword into the ground. The sword acted a lightning rod, drawing the energy into it and keeping Naruto safe. The blonde smirked and then vanished again. Brainstorm looked around and didn't see him. Suddenly there was a loud cracking, from below him. The crab managed to jump back, just in time, for the ground underneath him to break. Soon there was a massive hole that was in the spot Brainstorm was standing. He was currently floating due to his electromagnetic powers. Can't get me up here can you? he taunted. He was answered by a loud scream. The smoke was blown away to reveal the scream was from Naruto. The sonic waves made Brainstorm lose his concentration and fell to the ground. Naruto jumped out of the crater and used Brainstorm as a kickball. Naruto grinned. He then had to jump to avoid getting crushed by a stone hammer. Naruto turned to see Kevin, who was stone again behind him with a serious face. Naruto grinned and using some magnetic powers pulled Sting back over to him. Kevin shifted his arm to a sword form. The two charged at each other. 
The sound of metal and stone hitting filled the air, while the two clashed and RV showed up. Helen, Manny, Grandpa Max, Cooper, Pierce, the thorny guy, and Alan other normal-looking guy jumped out. How's it going? Max asked. Gwen pointed to the fighting Kevin and Naruto. Who is that? Alan asked. His name is Naruto, Gwen said, I don't know who he is, but he is one heck of a fighter. He can't be that good, Manny said. At that moment, Naruto jumped back and jumped over Kevin's stone sword. While in the air he vanished. Where did he dash? Clang, he was answered when Naruto appeared above him and brought the flat side of Sting down on his head. I hear that four eyes, Naruto said. Then he vanished and reappeared in front of Kevin before giving him a strong punch to the face. Ouch, Manny said from his position on the ground. He is good, Pierce said. Back in the fight, Kevin was getting really annoyed with this guy. He vanished again and Kevin looked around but couldn't see him anywhere. Suddenly a voice came out, Kenjutsu style, angry hornet. Naruto reappeared behind Kevin who didn't have time to react. Naruto then made multiple thrust with his sword. The result was the repeating sound of metal hitting stone. After a few seconds, the sound stopped and Naruto backed off. He set his sword on his shoulder. After a few seconds, Kevin's stone skin cracked and left him. Then he fell backwards showing he had some cuts on him. Gwen used her powers and brought him over to them. Is he okay? Gwen said. He's fine, Max said after taking a look, the cuts are shallow. The worst he'll need are a couple of bandages. Naruto turned to see Ben, now in his human form again, rising slowly and painfully from the ground. You know I'm getting a little bored with this, Naruto said, why don't you show me your real power boy? Okay, Ben grunted, but you asked for it. Ben messed with the dial and hit it. After the patented green flash, Naruto's eyes widened a great deal. He backed up and looked at the titan that stood above him. It was gray and red with fins coming out of its shoulders and head. Its eyes were bright yellow, and it had two growths coming out under its neck. There was also a large yellow diamond shape in its chest. Way big, the great colossus yelled. That is one big alien, Naruto said as he backed up a bit. It's over, Kevin said as he was now conscious and leaning on his girlfriend for support. I wouldn't bet on it, Max said. What do you mean? Alan asked. This kid is strong, Max said, now we'll see just how strong. Bye bye little man, way big said as he placed his hands in a formation near his chest. He then fired a blue beam from his chest aiming right for Naruto. The blonde just rose his hand and said, blast stopper motion. Seconded, Naruto moved his hand in a circle. It formed a ring and it sent out a few waves. The beam stopped right in front of Naruto, blocking it. Way Big stopped firing and gasped at the fact that this kid just stopped his most powerful alien's attack. My turn big man, Naruto said as he held up a hand. Slowly energy formed and then concentrated into a spinning ball. Slowly the ball grew and grew until it was about the size of a basketball. Then the charged. Way Big brought down his fist, which Naruto was able to stop and jump over. He landed on Giant's knuckle, then using incredible speed that no one had ever seen before ran up his arm. Finally, he was close to the Giant's face. Way Big, in one last attempt, brought his hand down on his arm. Naruto just jumped through his fingers. Night night big guy. Naruto yelled, Oatama Raisingan. The blonde slammed the spinning ball into the giant alien's forehead. There was a huge flash and a loud scream of pain from way big. Then to everyone's shock and fear the giant tumbled and fell to the ground with a loud crash. Naruto landed on the ground forming cracks in the ground, he looked at his handiwork. He smiled and said, David eat your heart out. There was a green flash and Ben was found getting up in the crater. Oh man, Ben groaned, my head is killing me. Taking a large spinning ball to the head tends to do that, Naruto joked. 
Ben was surprised, since the guy who could have destroyed him just a few seconds ago was actually joking around now. Um, Ben said, aren't you going to try and knock me down again? Nah, Naruto said, I took down your strongest alien. I think that proves I'm stronger. But you said you wanted to fight him, Kevin said standing on his own two feet with a little difficulty. I said I wanted to fight him, Naruto explained, I didn't say I wanted to kill him. If I wanted him dead, he'd be dead. He's right you know, said a voice Ben and others recognized. There was a flash and a small galvan appeared. Naruto thought it was Merlin until he saw that this had a mustache not a beard. Azimuth, Ben said, what are you doing here? I sensed multiple DNA signatures and decided to investigate, Azimuth said, imagine my surprise when I find you fighting this young man. How is it a surprise? Ben asked, he challenged me, and, I lost. Really? Azimuth asked, we'll talk about that later. I'm more concerned with who created him. Then a loud humming was heard as a large ship came into view above them. The bottom part opened up and a circular platform came into view. The platform lowered until it was at level with them. There was a little bit of dust in the air so no one could see who was on it. When it cleared it showed a galvan with a cane and a beard. Another galvan? Max asked. Hello Azimuth, Merlin said. Hello big brother, Azimuth said. Brother? Ben asked, when did this happen? Let's explain over smoothies, Naruto said, my treat. Everyone shrugged and got in their respective vehicles. While well, most of them did Naruto ran the way. At the groovy smoothie everyone sat down and got right to business after getting their drinks. So how did this happen? Ben asked. Well, Azimuth explained. Years ago around the time I made the Omnitrix my brother and I had a bit of a sibling rivalry trying to prove which of us was the smartest. I created the Omniturx while my brother chose to keep his project a secret. Unfortunately, before he could complete his project he was found with blood samples from many races of beings. The Galvan High Council assumed the worst and, despite my best efforts to prove my brother's innocence, banished him from our planet. If only they had looked, Merlin said taking a sip of his drink, I had the samples, but I never found a test subject that could handle the stress of the procedure. I wasn't about to let a creature die in the name of my own experiment. I told the council this, Azimuth said, that there was no test subject at the facility he worked at. Sadly they were too hard-headed to listen. Councils, Naruto groaned as he took a drink of his own, even in space they're nothing but a pain in the butt. Why do you say that? Gwen asked. Lady, Naruto said, I can't tell you how many times they've tried to either execute me or banish me. What? Ben asked. The others looked at him like he was crazy. Should I tell them? He asked Merlin. Your burden, Merlin said, your decision. Well, Naruto said, on the day of my birth, my home was attacked by a monster called the Kyubi no Kitsune or the Nine-Tailed Fox. The leader at the time, my father, couldn't kill it, so he did the next best thing. He sealed it in a newborn baby. Me. You hold a monster? Helen asked. Whoa, Cooper said. The others were too speechless to speak. My dad's last wish was that I be treated as a hero for keeping that monster at bay, Naruto continued. Instead my heritage was kept from me and I was ignored beaten burned and a whole lot of other crud that no child should go through. At those words after hearing that Kevin got up and walked over to a trash can. Everyone heard the sound of retching. He then returned to the table, wiped some of the excess vomit from his mouth and popped in some mint gum. Man, Kevin said as he chewed his gum, I was in the null void for a few years and I what I went through doesn't even compare to that. How can someone do that? Max asked clearly angry, it doesn't make sense. They got the idea that he was the QB trapped in a human form, Merlin said, idiots couldn't tell the difference between a sword and its sheath. Amen brother, Naruto said taking a huge gulp of his smoothie. How did you manage to survive that? Helen asked. Well, Naruto said, luckily the fox gave me enhanced regeneration. 
That is what allowed me to survive the hell that was once my village. So that s y Merlin chose you, Azimuth realized, your regeneration abilities allowed you to stand the strain of the operation. Hit the nail on the head, Naruto said. What operation exactly? Ben asked. Simple, Naruto said, Merlin didn't put the DNA in a device like the Omnitrix. He injected them into me. At that everyone who was drinking spat out their drinks except Merlin. They coughed and said all at the same time, what? They looked at each other and said in unison again, okay that was weird. Hey we did it again, they all said at the same time. They were all quiet and then said in unison, how do we keep doing that? Enough already that's starting to freak me out, Naruto said. All right, Ben said as everyone calmed down, you have the DNA of aliens inside of you. Yep, Naruto said and listed on his fingers, Pyrosapiens, Petrosapiens, Anodites, Celestialsapiens, and the list goes on. You have Celestialsapien DNA? Gwen asked, shocked. Yep, Naruto said, luckily I don't have to deal with that whole multiple voice thing, though I still have to say the word seconded when I use it as an activation code or some nonsense like that. But how are you able to use them? Azimuth asked, it would take centuries to use them and the skills you used in the battle against Tennyson. True, Naruto said, I am in fact much older than I look. You can't be that much older, Manny said as he took a drink of his smoothie. I'm 1,213 years old big man, Naruto said, making Manny spit his drink all over Helen. But how? You look just as old as Kevin, Cooper said. This was really interesting to him. Remember when I said the QB was sealed in me? Naruto asked, well as I grew his chakra became mine. After a while all its chakra became mine and he vanished from the world. Too bad he was a good teacher. Anyway, when I go the last of its chakra, when I turned 18, its regenerative powers gained an extra kick. It repairs all damaged and aged cells. That means, Cooper realized, you have eternal youth? Exactly, Naruto said, according to him any girl I marry will become like that too. Eternally young and eternally beautiful. There is one last thing that puzzles me, Azimuth said. How could you be 1,213 years old when me and brother only started out projects 15 years ago? Hyperbolic time chamber, Merlin answered finishing his smoothie. Of course, Azimuth said, the time chamber has a time rate slower than the world outside it. Correct my brother, Merlin said, it was our father's finest work. So what now? Ben asked, since he fought me, he doesn't have to stay, does he? No, Merlin said, but what he does now is up to him. I think I'll go back home, Naruto said, but I don't know what I'll do. My village probably thinks I'm dead. Plus, they'll probably try to steal my secrets from me. I don't know what to do when I go back. You'll figure it out, Merlin said as he got up, now it's time to go. The two got up to leave. Wait, Max said stopping them. They turned to him. I told Plumber HQ about your abilities, Max said as he reached into his pocket, they figured that you would be much better as an ally than an enemy. In English kid, you just got drafted. He took out a plumber's badge and handed it to the blonde who took it and grinned. He then attacked it to his belt like a buckle. Thanks little boy, Naruto said. Max groaned slightly since he was being called that. The others though couldn't help but laugh at the old man's misfortune. No problem old timer, Max said to Naruto, making him grin like a fox. Well, Naruto said, time to go. See you around. The two then jumped on the platform lowered by Merlin's ship and rose up to it. Then, with a sonic boom, the ship took off. You know what makes me wonder? Ben said as everyone looked at him, why the press was never around during this whole thing. Maybe they didn't notice or something, Kevin said. Well I'm going home, Ben said, going for his car. Why? Helen asked. To get some painkillers for this headache, the boy said rubbing his skull. The others couldn't help but laugh. So what's been going on in my old home pipsqueak? Naruto asked Merlin as they went home. Well, Merlin said, your council has been trying to have you marked as a missing mean, 
Tsunade has been able to keep them from doing just that and just labeled you as MIA, missing in action. What about Sasuke and the rest of the Kanoha 12? Naruto asked. The ones who went with you on the mission have recovered just fine thanks to the skills of the medic ninja who leads your village. That pink-haired girl is angry at you for hurting the Echiha boy as are other people. Hell, she even tried to order that old woman to have you executed for doing so. She was then thrown from the window. Good old granny, Naruto said. You know you can't call her that now, right? Merlin asked. Yeah, Naruto said, but it'll piss her off all the same. Good point, Merlin said, but I suggest you now show your face so soon. As such I made you this. Merlin then presented a mask to Naruto. It was like an ANBU mask. The only difference was that there was the Omnitrix was on the forehead and there were two large white eyes. I suggest you wear this, Merlin said, you don't want to be attacked, just as soon as you enter the gates do you? Good point, Naruto said. He put on the mask and found that it didn't impair his vision. There is also something else you should know, Merlin said, your sensei that Hataki character didn't even bother looking for you when you went missing. He even said that he felt a great deal of your tenant's chakra in the area. That favorite's playing son of a dash Naruto started but was stopped when Merlin jumped up and bopped him over the head. Watch your language boy, the Galvin said harshly. Sorry, Naruto said rubbing his skull. A few minutes later, they arrived at the drop site, which was few miles from Kanoha. Naruto jumped off. He looked around and saw that no one was around. He unsealed Sting only this time it was in a large black sheath, which Naruto put on his back. He then made his way toward his home. When he approached, he found that there was some kind of festival going on. Halt, who goes there, said one of the guards. Someone who has been traveling a while and wishes to find a place to rest a while, Naruto lied his voice sounding deeper due to the mask. Okay then, the guard said, you mind telling us why you have a sword? An armed traveler is less likely to gain attention from bandits than an unarmed traveler, Naruto said behind his mask. The two seemed to buy it as they let him pass. Naruto passed through the gates and was greeted to the wild sound of partying. Every store was lit up and celebrating. Naruto was wondering what the whole thing was about when he was approached by a woman with pink hair. Hey Mr. Mysterious, she said in a flirty voice, you looking for a good time? Not right now, the blonde answered, mind telling my what this whole celebration is about? You don't know? The woman asked, today is the day that a demon was killed by a great hero. Three years ago, Sasuke Uchiha killed the Kyubi, no Yoko. The young here lured the demon out of the village where he used his Sharingan to weaken it and then slay it. I see, the blonde said slightly angry that these people spat on his so-called grave. Now why don't you take off that mask and we go have some fun, the woman asked running a hand up the boy's muscled chest. Sorry, the man said, but I have a wife waiting at home. Oh, she pouted, well if you're ever feeling lonely, here's my address. She left with a wink and a sway of her hips. Naruto rolled his eyes behind his mask and continued wailing. As he walked toward the tower, he noticed that one place didn't seem to be celebrating. It was a restaurant owned by the Akamichi. Using his enhanced hearing he heard voices. Unfortunately, the partying made it hard for anyone to understand what they were saying. Naruto made his way to restaurant and opened the door. Sorry we're closed, said Chiza Akamichi at the counter. I'm not here for food, Naruto said behind his mask, I'm here for a little information. On what, said a familiar voice. He turned to see the rest of the Kanoha 12 sitting at a table. The only ones not there were Sasuke and Sakura. Each one of them in a different outfit than before. Basically they're Shippuden outfits. I don't want to go into it. With them were the Jonin save Kakashi. I asked someone outside about the festival going on, the masked blonde said, I don't think I got whole story. Of course you weren't, Eno spat. They probably told you the noble Uchiha lured the so-called demon out of the village and killed him, right? Yes, the masked blonde said feigning ignorance, why? It wasn't like that, Kiba said taking a swig of sake, the Uchiha ran away from the village. 
the demon and a few of his friends followed him. They encountered resistance, but the demon beat the Echiha. After that the demon went missing. How do you know that? the masked boy asked. I was on that mission, Kiba growled, my mom said that some of the civilian council said that the demon should be killed, they even had the gall to say that they didn't lose any good shinobi. Hell me and my friends almost died on that mission. You talk like this demon was your friend, Naruto said. He was then picked up by a very angry Chuji. He was our friend, the young Akamichi growled, if he was a demon, he wouldn't have fought beside us. He wouldn't have helped us. He would have just wiped this village off the map. He was no demon. He was what held it. You know of the Jinchuriki? Naruto asked surprised. Yeah, Ino said, it was made public after he went missing. I just wish I had been nicer to him. If I had no I wouldn't have been such a... Chiji let Naruto down and went over to Ino and put an arm around her. Naruto adjusted his coat. Thank you for telling me the truth, the masked blonde said, what happened to this Echiha boy? He was basically give a slap on the wrist, Shikimura growled, they even wanted him promoted for it. You hear me? They wanted him promoted for killing someone. All the while his pink-haired whore was beside him the whole time. There is intelligence in a village of fools, Naruto said, good to know. Yeah, Hinata said, I'm glad that not everyone sees him as a monster in this village. What are you doing here, said a voice that made Naruto bristle, behind his mask. Sakura, Chiji growled, you know you aren't allowed in here. Come on Chiji lighten up, Sakura said. Not unless you finally give up that spoiled brat, Ino growled. Come on. Sakura yelled, Sasuke is a here for killing that monster. Even if he is alive, he should just rot in a ditch somewhere. He should dash. She was cut off by the sound of a sword being drawn. Naruto stood with sting drawn. He looked at Sakura and could feel the anger behind the eyes of the mask. Get out, the man said, before I use you as a practice dummy. Sakura gulped and ran out the door. That she ran in from. Harlot, Naruto growled sheathing his sword. Where did you get that? Ten Ten asked, eyeing his sword. She had been since he walked in. A friend gave it to me, the blonde answered, now I must go. I have business to take care of. He then left. The blonde mingled over everything that had been told to him. His friends and the jonin save his sensei and teen didn't see him as a monster. The rest of the village did. Naruto then realized he had been wrong about this village. They would only see him as a monster and nothing but that. If he had brought Sasuke back, then they would have him executed for what he did to him. He made up his mind. He entered the Hokage Tower. He made his way up to Tsunade's office. He then lightly knocked. Come in, said the voice of Shizun. The masked blonde entered. He found Tsunade with a huge bottle of sake in her hand and was currently chugging it down. You shouldn't drink like that, the masked man said, you could kill yourself. What do you want? Tsunade asked the masked stranger, shouldn't you be partying with the other idiots in this village? I don't see a reason to party about a comrade and loyal fighter going missing, Naruto said behind his mask. At least there's someone here with a brain, Tsunade said, throwing away her bottle. Unfortunately, the blonde said, I'm not here for pleasure, I'm here for business. What business? Tsunade asked. Oh, Naruto said thinking on his feet, my name is Naraku Namakase, distant relative of Minato Namakase. You're a descendant of the Namakase clan? Tsunade asked, not believing him, prove it. The blonde held up a hand and formed a raisin in his hand. Tsunade felt her jaw drop in shock. I watched my relative create this, the blonde said, I believe that this is a move only someone of my clan can use. Okay, Tsunade spoke, but I need more concrete evidence. Give me a sample of your blood. The blonde took out a kunai and ran the blade over his hand. Tsunade took out a piece of paper and the blood fell on. She then walked over to a cabinet and took out a vial of blood. She then put the blood on the paper. After a few seconds, the paper turned blue. 
You really are related, Tsunade said, clearly shocked. I want you to call the council, Naruto said behind his mask, there are a few words I would like to say to them. Tsunade nodded. A few minutes later, in the council chamber. Why did that wretched old hag call this meeting? Hamura growled, I have much better things to do than just sit here. No sooner did the elder say that did said wretched old hag walk in with a masked blonde man. Tsunade, what is going on? asked a civilian councilman, we have a festival to hold and we shouldn't be wasting it here. I guess you have finally come to your senses and decided to send Hunter Neen after that brat, Koharu said with a smirk. No, Tsunade said, I have called you here to tell you some very good news. The Namake's clan hasn't died out. There were looks of shock and awe all around the council room, especially from the shinobi clans. How is he a member of the Namake's clan? asked Danzo. I performed a blood test on him, Tsunade said, his DNA matches his to where they are relatives. I believe he has come for his inheritance from the clan. Well then, Hamura said rising, I believe we should put him under the CRA so the Namake's clan can be revived. No, the blonde said, crossing his arms. What do you mean no? Kohara said shocked. I mean, Naruto explained harshly behind his mask, that I won't sire children for you to control and that I won't revive my clan in a village full of morons and some councilmen who care more about lining their pocket than the welfare of the village. How dare you speak to us this way? asked a councilman outraged at the man's behavior. I speak to you because I can, Naruto said still mad at them. I have seen what this village has become and it is not even a shadow of its former glory. My relative told me of the will of fire. Now I see it is only just a spark in an eternal blackness. How dare you? A councilwoman with pink hair shrieked, I suggest you be quiet, the blonde growled drawing sting, before I carve out your heart. The woman gulped loudly as she sat back down. Now, Naruto said putting his sword back in its sheath, I do want what my relative had here. I will be taking it with me when I leave. What? The shinobi sighed, yelled this time. You can't just take his secrets out of here. Psum yelled. My dear lady, Naruto said looking at her, this place has fallen far in the years that have passed. I will not restart my clan here, for it would only bring shame to my relative's sacrifice all those years ago. I shall take it and restart elsewhere. You cannot take them. Hamura growled, we will not allow it. Then let us settle this, with a wager, Naruto sighed, smirking behind his mask. What wager? Tsunade asked clearly interested. Set me against the this demon slayer I've heard so much about, Naruto said, plus the children of the shinobi clan heads. If I win I get my family's secrets, and I get to leave here unopposed. Should I lose, that will be up to you. We accept, Kohara said wickedly. All the while Danzo, a man who was completely wrapped in bandages sat and thought. He had a feeling this boy was familiar, but he couldn't quite place where he had seen him before. About an hour later. Everyone had heard of the challenge for the right to the Namakase title. Everyone rushed to the stadium and filed in. People were placing bets left and right. Most of them were for the failure of the stranger. In the ring Naruto, still masked, stood across from his old friends. Sasuke and Sakura were there too, with them was some unknown boy with a weird smile on his face. Who does this guy think he is? Sakura asked out loud, if anyone should get the Namikaze stuff it's Sasuke. Will you shut up? Shikimaru said. All right, Tsunade said, the fight between the Kanoha 12 and Naraku Namikaze for the Namikaze property will begin shortly. Begin. Youthful stranger, Lee said, taking his stance, I would to let you know that there are no hard feeling between us in this fight. I speak not only for me, but for my comrades. I swear this by my fires of youth. The feeling is mutual, Naruto said, I hold no bad blood for you or your comrades. Now let us fight. Show me these fires of youth. Lee drove forward at the stranger at an incredible speed. The bowl cut boy jumped and yelled, Leaf Hurricane. The blonde man braced himself before catching the kick with his bare hand. 
He then pulled on Lee's ankle and then threw him across the arena into the opposite wall where he met it with a loud bam. Everyone stared in shock at the pure strength the blonde man had. Whoa boy, Kiba said as he gulped nervously. Niji came up next with the usual Hyuga combat stance. He charged at the blonde. Naruto got into a stance himself and dodged each strike fluidly. Then in the same fluid-like motion grabbed the Hyuga's arm and then sent out a punch that connected with his elbow. The Hyuga screamed in pain as there was a loud crack. He fell to one knee clutching his now broken arm. Niji! Ten Ten yelled. The girl ran at Naruto taking out a katana. Naruto drew sting. The sound of singing steel filled the arena as the two clashed. The two locked swords multiple times. Then they both broke away. I must admit, Naruto said, you are very adept with a sword. Thanks, Ten Ten said. Sadly, Naruto said getting in a stance, all great things must come to an end. The blonde drew back his sword and shot off at an incredible speed. His sword flashed red as he yelled, Kenjutsu, judgment cut. The blonde swung and stopped running on the other side of Ten Ten. There was thick silence in the air, before Ten Ten let out a scream of pain. A huge gash appeared on her front as she fell to the ground in obvious pain. Got you! Kiba yelled as he and his dog Akamaru charged. Naruto was surprised to see that Akamaru got so big. He was big enough to ride and he used to ride on Kiba's head. What was it the Inazuka fed him? Kiba swung his claws and Naruto jumped over him. He landed on his hands and then spun sending multiple kicks toward Kiba. The dog user was knocked to the ground. Akamaru jumped at the blonde. Naruto then using the power of the Anodite shot out a blue energy leash that wrapped around the dog and kept him from moving. I know the color is pink, but I decided to change the color a bit. It's a little girly for a male ninja. What the hell is that? Hinata asked. I don't know, Shino said, stranger I would like to withdraw from our fight. Why is that? Naruto asked though he knew why. If I fight you, I could have incredible damage done to my hive, Shino explained, you easily took down some of my stronger allies. It is illogical for me to fight someone who is clearly my better. Wise choice, Naruto said turning to Hinata, and what of you young Hyuga? Will you fight me? The answer was Hinata getting into her family's stance. Naruto got into his own. Hinata charged at the blonde ad tried to hit him. The blonde dodged or blocked each movement. Finally, he grabbed Hinata's ARM and threw her up in the air. Then his arms turned to bandages and then wrapped around Hinata gently bringing her back to earth and leaving her tied up and unable to fight. Naruto's arms turned back to normal. Everyone was staring at the fact that this man had powers never seen before in a Namikaze. People were immediately thinking bloodline. Back in the ring, Naruto felt a strong burst of chakra. He turned to see Lee, who was now radiating green energy and now had red skin. He charged at Naruto with blinding speed. Naruto didn't have time to react. He quickly absorbed the energy from the ground beneath him and turned to rock. He was then sent flying across the arena. He crashed into the wall. The blonde rose up nursing his stomach as he felt cracks and layer of stone that had become his flesh. Naruto growled. Then accessing more alien DNA he turned into a blur. No one saw anything. They only heard loud booms as they two, incredibly speedy ninja, clashed with one another. Then there was a loud boom and a crater formed in the middle of the arena. Then Naruto appeared above it. Then he dove down and brought his heel and sent Lee deeper into the ground. Naruto was about to move when he felt himself go rigid. He turned then knew he was strapped in Shikimaru's shadow possession jutsu. The blonde then saw Ino move in front of him doing hand signs. Mind transfer jutsu, she called out as her mind entered Naruto's. Complete, Shikimaru said. Suddenly the blonde began to shake and writhe like he was having a seizure. Ino's body, which had fallen to the ground, rose up with a gasp. Not happening little girl, Naruto said. Shikimaru sent out his shadow and caught Naruto again. 
This time Naruto sent a pulse of electricity, thanks to the DNA he had from a megawatt. Shikimaru cried out in pain as he was electrocuted. Oh no you don't. Chuji yelled, partial expansion jutsu. Left arm. The Akamichi sent out his enlarged arm. The blonde just stood there. As the fist neared, he held out an arm and caught the fist with one hand, making everyone gasp. Chuji was then lifted off the ground and then slammed into the arena wall multiple times. Hey, a voice rang out. He turned to see Sakura charging at him. The blonde jumped out of the way of the fist. Good thing he did, because a huge crater formed where she hit the ground. The blonde narrowed his eyes. Then his arms were covered in crystal. The blonde then clasped his hands together. He turned became a blur and reappeared in front of Sakura. He brought both hands up and nailed her in the chin. She was sent flying and crashed through the arena wall. Pathetic, Naruto said, how she became a ninja, I will never know. Sorry loser, Sasuke said, but now you face the strongest of the Kanoha 12. The blonde kid? Naruto asked, if he's the strongest, then let him prove it. I mean me. Sasuke yelled. Quiet boy. Naruto said glaring at Sasuke, behind his mask, I'll fight him and then the so-called demon slayer. Naruto turned his attention to the boy and asked, What is your name child? My name is Sai, the blonde said. Okay, Naruto said, cracking his knuckles, let's see what you can do. Sai took out a sketch pad and a few ink tigers burst from the pages. The tigers growled menacingly. Then they charged. Naruto grinned behind his mask. He took a deep breath and let out a cold breath. The ink the tigers were made of froze and then shattered. Specialized ink that comes to life when chakra is added, Naruto observed very nice. Before Sai could say anything he was blasted by a neuroshock fired from Naruto's eyes. Jetray's power. The blast knocked Sai to the ground and straight into the darkness of unconsciousness. Now Demon Slayer, Naruto said facing Sasuke, your turn. Sasuke grinned and went through hand signs before he yelled, Fire style, Fireball Jutsu. The fireball shot at Naruto at an incredible speed. Naruto accessed his powers and his body was then turned to lava rock. The flames engulfed him, not causing him any pain. The boy then absorbed the fire and shot it back out at the Echiha. Sasuke dodged, but was met with the blonde's boot as it made contact with his stomach. Naruto then hit him with a mental shockwave that made the Echiha scream out in pain. The Echiha hit the ground. You, Sasuke growled as he rose up, despite the pain, how did you get that power? My power was given to me by God, Naruto said, he blessed me with this strength, and I will use it. You will not have my power. Sasuke growled as he went through a few more hand signs. Then the sound of chirping birds filled the air. A ball of electricity formed in Sasuke's hand. This is my ultimate technique, Sasuke gloated, the Chidori. The move I used to kill the demon. Not bad, Naruto said clearly not impressed as he had seen this before, now let me show you a real assassin's technique. The blonde went through hand signs and got into a stance. Then there was a high-pitched squeal as multiple energies filled Naruto's palm, then there was a small energy ball made up of a great deal of energies. Let's see how the Chidori, 1000 birds, Naruto spoke, does against the Omnidori, 1000 powers. Sasuke got over his shock. He had his Sharingan out, but he couldn't copy it. Hell he had it out the entire time and he couldn't copy anything that this guy had done tonight. The two then charged at each other. The attacks clashed with a resounding explosion. The two moves clashed for a few seconds, then there was a huge explosion. Everyone covered their eyes to keep the dust and smoke from getting in their eyes. Luckily, after the other fighters had been knocked out, Medic Nin Shu shined in and got them out to be examined. When the smoke cleared it showed Naruto standing with Sasuke knocked out against the wall. Despite the Echiha's loss everyone applauded for the great show they had seen. Everyone stared at the raw power that a mere 16-year-old had. A few minutes later, in the Hokage's office. Okay, sign here, here, and initial here, Tsunade said as Naraku signed the contract. 
I have to say the Namikes will be in good hands with you, Tsunade said as she smiled for the first time in three years. I have to ask though, how did you make a version of Kakashi's technique? I saw him use it years ago, the blonde answered, I was inspired. It took a while, but I managed to get it my own version. Well, Tsunade said handing the boy a scroll, this is all the Namike scrolls and money sealed in here. Now I suggest you leave while you can. Some people here are still ignorant about the whole thing. Plus some people are upset you beat their hero dot. She put up air quotes at the word hero. Right then, Naruto as he teleported out of the room and out of the village, leaving a shocked Tsunade. Outside the village. Naruto smiled as he saw he was a good distance from Kanoha. He took off his mask as he heard bushed rustling. He turned to see some of his clones come out carrying a large gold coffin. We got him, one clone said, the fight at the arena had everyone occupied. Good, Naruto said, now I suggest we get moving we have a lot of work to do. The scene opens to reveal a cave. Said cave is close to the borders of fire and lightning country. In the cave Naruot removes his mask. He looks down at the golden coffin. He shook his head and prayed to every known deity that this would work. Naruto then took a few steps back before sitting Indian style on the floor. He was silent, then chakra started to flow out of him. The seal on his stomach flashed, and he spoke. Shinigami, Naruto spoke, though the seal I speak to you. If you wish, grant me audience. Nothing happened for a few moments. Then after a little silence, there was a huge burst of purple flames. When it cleared Naruto, nearly had a heart attack at the sight of the figure before him. The figure was a woman in black robes. The robes easily showed off her hourglass figure. She had long pale white hair. He couldn't see her face due to the fact that she wore a skull mask that covered her face. Isn't this a shock, the woman said. You're the Shinigami? Naruto asked. The woman giggled and reached for her mask. She removed it to reveal a pale face with purple eyes and a pair of blood-red lips. Naruto blushed as he saw the woman's face. She giggled at the sight of the look on the blonde's face. She walked over swaying her hips and bent over looking him in the eyes with a flirtatious smile. See something you like big boy? she asked. Naruto was launched back by a nosebleed of epic proportions. He crashed into the back of the cave wall he was hiding out in. Shinigami giggled at the boy's reaction. About an hour later, Naruto was drowsy as he woke up. Are you all right? The blonde looked up to see his head was resting in the Shinigami's lap. The blonde boy blushed again and then got up and stood up. I'm sorry for staring, Naruto apologized, it's just had I wasn't expecting you to be, well. A woman, the woman asked gaining an angered look, listen kid if you think that, dash, you misunderstand, Naruto said, I expecting a vicious monstrous thing, not a beautiful woman. Shinigami giggled again, before looking at him with a seductive smirk. So why did you call me? If you want we can have some fun, she said jiggling her chest in a very persuasive manner. Sorry, Naruto said, I'm here for business, not pleasure. The death goddess snapped her fingers and pouted playfully. She then snapped her fingers again. This time there was a flash of purple flames. When it cleared it showed a small table with a teapot and a few cups. There were also a few slices of lemon, some sugar cubes, and a few spoons. There were two more flashes, and two chairs appeared. She motioned for Naruto to sit and he did. So what is it you want to talk business about? The death goddess asked as she poured her and Naruto cup. Well, Naruto explained, I understand that you swallowed my father's soul after he fought the Kyubi. I know this, Shinigami said as she squeezed some lemon into her cup. I would like to request that you release my father's soul, Naruto said. Well, Shinigami said, I don't know if I can. I will need some compensation for this. I can offer you a few souls in return, Naruto said sipping his drink. Really? the woman asked, whose soul will I be taking? The soul of Orochimaru and the Akatsuki members, the blonde answered, setting down his empty cup. A very tempting offer, Shinigami said as her mouth started to water, 
such evil souls, will be greatly appreciated. Plus Yami and Kami have been just dying to finally put those poor freaks in their places. While we're on the subject, Naruto said, are they girls too? Yes, Shinigami said, all the major celestial figures are. Hard to believe everyone thinks we're all male though. While some people just don't want to believe that a woman is capable of such power and destruction, given how dangerous some of the gods are, Naruto said smiling. Well then, Shinigami said, shall we seal the deal? The two rose up from the seats and the table and chairs vanished in more flames. Naruto held out his hand to shake with the Shinigami. She grabbed his hand and then pulled him into a deep rough kiss that made Naruto's eyes roll into the back of his head. The two actually started to make out for a few seconds before the two separated with a noise that sounded like two plungers separating. The death goddess licked her lips before blowing Naruto a kiss and sinking into the ground. Naruto shook himself from his daze. He decided to count that as his first kiss seeing as the first one was a moment that he would never ever speak of again. Naruto was taken from his memories by the gold coffin next to him shaking and lid being thrown open. Out of the coffin stepped a tall blonde with spiky hair and two long tails going down the sides of his head. He wore a black shirt and long baggy pants and pair of black sandals. Over his shirt he wore a white trench coat with Kanoha's yellow flash written on the back. Oh my head, Minato groaned, what's going on? The last thing I remember was fighting Kyuubi, and, Kyuubi. What's going on? Where am I? Easy big man, Naruto said kneeling beside his father. How long has it been? Minato asked, what year is it, 2011, Naruto answered. 2011? Mianto asked, but I thought it was, oh my god. It's been 16 years. I've been gone from my son for 16 years. Easy now dad, Naruto said, send a shock through his father. Minato then turned to what he though was a clone of himself, for a couple of seconds. And Naruto? Minato gasped. Hey there pop, Naruto said. The blonde was then crushed into a hug, by his father. So Naruto, the Yandame said, how have things been in the village? Naruto sat down on a rock and said, you're going to want to sit down for this one pops. Minato sat down. Naruto told his father of his life and how he was treated. How he was shunned and how he was spat on by everyone. As he carried on Minato, slowly got angrier. He was livid when he heard about what his own student had done. He was however surprised and interested at what had happened to Naruto recently. Naruto, Mianto said as his son finished, if I ever get my hands on my student or on any other Kanoha ninja, their ass is mine. It's okay dad, Naruto said, I can understand you're angry, but we can't just storm down there and start blowing the place apart, you need to get your strength back. There was a silence between the two for a moment. So did you ever get to see the aliens other than that Galvin? Minato asked. No, Naruto said, not yet anyway. All I know is there are human-slash-alien hybrids on Earth. It's probably how bloodlines came to be in the elemental countries anyway. Minato was about to say something when a small orb-like drone floated into the cave. The orb opened up and a hologram of Merlin appeared. Naruto, Merlin said, I received your message and construction is underway. I don't know why you would want to build it there of all places though. Believe me, Naruto said, it works. So, Minato said making himself known, that is a Galvin. I though you said he was small. I look bigger as a hologram, Merlin said a little annoyed, now my drones have already started construction. Your project should be done in about a month. Until the make up for lost time with your father. With that last sentence, the hologram dissipated and the drone flew off into the sky. What project is that son? Minato asked. Well, Naruto said, I'm creating a new hidden village. Since my old home wants me dead, I figured that I could create a new home somewhere else. Where do you plan on putting this one? Minato asked, I really doubt that any of the other major villages would be very fond of the idea of another village popping up out of nowhere. I'm putting this one on a place no one will be able to go unless we let them, Naruto said with a smirk, the moon. 
Minato's eyes widened for a few seconds and then shook his head to clear his mind. The moon? Minato asked getting a nod from his son, man, and I thought I was an adventurous person. I wonder what your mother would be thinking now. She would probably be kicking you to hell and back for sealing the fox in me, Naruto chuckled, before saying I was insane. One month later. In Kiri, the Mizukage sat at her desk. The Mizukage was a woman with long red hair blue lipstick with a battle kimono with a fishnet shirt underneath it. Basically, she was a very beautiful and shapely woman. Right now she was locked in battle with the bane of the job of being a kage, paperwork. I can't believe I'm still stuck doing this, she yelled as her mountain of paperwork seemed to be laughing at her. She shook it off and thought of it only as temporary madness due to the fact that this succeeding in driving her to complete and total madness. She then heard a tapping noise at her window. She turned and saw a small metallic round orb. Ayo! Chujuro, the woman yelled, get in here. Second later a thin man with glasses and a sword wrapped around his back, and a man with spiky blue hair and an eye patch walked into the room. What is it Mizukage sama the man with glasses, Chujuro, asked. Then they both noticed the orb at the window. The Mizukage slowly opened the window and the orb floated in and hovered into the room. Slowly the metal formed indentations in the shapes of hands. There were three total. The three ninja looked at each other for a second. Then they approached the orb and very slowly and carefully placed their hands on the indents. Then there was a huge flash of light and they were gone. A second later. The three ninja reappeared in a large dark room with two other people. One was an old man with a large red nose, rectangle-shaped eyebrows, and a mustache and beard that had square edges. The other was a large well-built man with dark skin white hair with a mustache and beard. Both of them wore kage robes and a hat. The man with the big nose had the kanji for rock on his hat, while the dark-skinned man had the kanji for cloud on his. Such a kijdan, reikijdano, the mizukage said with shock in her voice. Mizukijdano, the reikage said, what is going on? I don't know, she said. Me and my friends here were brought here by some metal orb thing. The same with me, that such a kid said, what is going on here? I believe I can explain, said a new voice. The five turned to see a man in lab coat carrying a pocket watch. Who are you? The rakage asked, clenching his fists underneath his kage robes. You can call me Paradox, the man said taking out a bag, gumball? Oh thanks, Chijiro said taking the candy. You're welcome Chijiro, Paradox said shocking everyone. You know me? The swordsman asked. Yes I know you and your friend Ao over there, Paradox said. I also know that the Tsuchikage's name is Anoki, the Reikage's is A, and the Mizukage's is Mei. So you know who we are, a growled, are you here to assassinate us or something? Quiet the opposite, the scientist said, I'll take you to the man who brought you here. Shall we? With that the professor walked toward the wall, which then opened up. The three kages and the two jonin with them followed the scientist. When they existed they were shocked by what they saw made their jaws drop. In front of them was a magnificent city. The buildings stretched to the sky. Around them there were vehicles that flew through the air at great and terrifying speeds. What really got them were the strange humanoid creatures that walked among them. They clearly weren't human as some of them had red or blue or purple skin. Some flew through the air. All in all they were shocked. What really had them going though was the fact that when they looked up they saw a dark night sky. What was beyond that though was a large blue and planet. Is, is that? May asked in shock. Yep, Paradox said with a smirk, that's your planet. Now I don't think our Kage wants to be kept waiting. With those words, the five shook out of their shock and followed the scientist. After a bit, they arrived at a large tower in the middle of the city. They followed the scientist who stepped onto a glowing pad. Reluctantly, the ninja followed him and then they vanished from the spot. A few seconds later, they reappeared on another pad in an office. The Kages and Jonan looked a little messed up. What the hell was that? I asked as he tried to regain his bearings. 
teleportation, Paradox said like it was the simplest thing in the world, you'll get used to it after a while. I hope so, Anelki said as he rose up from his current kneeling position. When they all regained their bearings, they were shocked by what they saw. Standing in front of the window facing away out the window was a tall man with spiky blonde hair. He wore a white trench coat that had the kanji for yellow flash on it. Eminato? I asked rubbing his eyes to make sure he wasn't dreaming. The blonde turned to reveal Minato's face to them. Chijiro and Ao promptly fainted while the Mei, A, and Anelki looked shocked. Anelki's face went stormy. How are you alive? May asked, I thought you died fighting the QB. I was dead, Minato said, but in exchange for sending the souls of a lot of missing Nin the Shinigami returned my soul. She's actually really nice, once you get to know here. Oh well that was nice of. I started, but stopped when he realized what Minato said, wait, she? The Shinigami is a girl? Yep, Minato said with a grin, so are all the other gods. Everyone won silent. Chijiro and Ao woke up just in time for Mei to shout to the heavens, yes. Take that you sexist pigs. The greatest entities are women. Ha. Huh. The males present stared at the woman who realized what she had just done and blushed prettily. So, Anoki said, why are we here Namiks? Minato shook his head. He had a feeling IWA would still be a little upset over what happened during the Third Shinobi War. I brought you here so that we could discuss an alliance between our villages, Minato said sitting down. Five other chairs popped out of the ground in front of the man's desk. The five guests sat down while Paradox went to the side of the room. So what do we get in return for an alliance? I asked the long though dead Kage. Despite being on opposite sides of the war he and Minato were in fact very good friends. First of all, Minato started to explain advanced weaponry that could help you out in the long run for starters. Second advancements in medicine could save lives and probably help replenish ranks that have lost limbs or stuff like that. Explain, Anoki said as he heard that. The sciences in medicine are incredibly advanced, Minato stated, much more advanced than the tech on earth. Such technology allows people to regain lost limbs and be more thoroughly examined for mental instabilities and stuff like that. The people present sat there stupefied at the thought of such technology being at their fingertips. Uh, Linakage, Moon Shadow, May asked nervously, I was wondering, is your son alive? Yes, Minato said with a smirk, as a matter of fact he is why? May's eyes went stormy for a few seconds before she gained her composure. Well, she said, after the QB attack I was told by an ANBU that the boy had died during the ceiling. The moon shadow looked mad as his eyes narrowed with a look of obvious frustration. Who told you that? The elder blonde asked. Some ANBU in a dog mask why? She asked. Seconds later, they were all hit with a vicious killing intent. Minato clenched his desk so hard it actually cracked and his eyes portrayed anger. Kakashi, Minato growled, I, I get my hands on him I swear I am going to kill him. Who? I asked. My student Kakashi Hitaki, Minato said, you might know him as Kakashi of the Sharingan. He was one of my students years ago. Apparently, he didn't want you and him to be together since he and probably a lot of other people didn't want my son out of the village. Why would they not want him out of the village? Anoki asked the blonde curious. That's for something for him to tell you and not me, Minato said with a sad look in his eyes. Can I go see him? May asked. Sure, Minato said, knowing him he's probably out in the training hall. My boy is strong and he keeps, would we know him? I asked his old friend. Yes, Minato said as he got up and walked to the teleported pad, I believe he's known as, the Chimera. The three Kages and two Jonan froze at the name. The Chimera had made himself known for killing high-ranked missing Nin and destroying mercenary camps. Information regarding him was shady at best. He was about six foot in height, wearing black and green armor with a white trench coat that had the kanji for ultimate life form on the back in green. 
A helmet covered his face that was completely blank and covered the back of his head and draped down and wrapped around his neck. He was known to have three weapons. One was a katana that was able to use multiple elements, a glowing green sword that cut through the toughest of metals, and a large sword with a skull and a scorpion on it that seemed to poison people when it cut you. On top of that, he seemed to have incredible control over multiple elements and his chakra. He was one of the few people in the bingo book who had been given an S-rank status and a flea on sight order. Those who were dumb enough to ignore this were either never seen again or were found later with multiple injuries. He's the chimera? Anoki asked in complete and total shock. Yep, Minato said with a proud smile on his face. The boy's sixteen and he's already surpassed me. At least with this I don't have to worry about training him. He stepped on the teleported pad and waited for a minute, but no one came up. Are you guys coming or what? he asked getting their attention. The Kages and Jonan all walked up and got on the pad. A second later there was a flash and they were gone. Paradox smiled to himself as he took out his pocket watch and vanished in a blur. At the training hall. Mianto and the Kages appeared in a sudden flash of color. The three foreign Kages and two Jonin shook themselves as they tried to shake the sensations fro em their bodies. To be quite honest, none of them really knew if they were ever going to get used to that. I know, Minato said with a smile, it took me about a week to get used to that. I'm not entirely sure if I am. When their senses finally cleared they saw a man in black and green armor with a white trench coat that had the kanji for ultimate life form on the back in green. He was basically a real ringer, for Minato pet, he had three whisker marks on each cheek. The blonde stood with a katana in his hand that that had the kanji for fire, water, earth, wind, and lightning. The blonde took a stance, before turning to large wooden dummy. He drew back his katana, before swinging and calling out, Kenjutsu, wind style, raging hurricane. As the blonde swung his weapon a humongous blast shot of air shot forward. The dummy was struck hard and turned to splinters, and leaving a huge crater in its path. Everyone stared in shock at the pure power behind the blast. Hey Naruto! Minato yelled getting his son's attention. The blonde placed the katana on his upper arm and it was sealed into the seal underneath it. The blonde then made his way to the stunned group. Hey dad, Naruto said with a smile, who are the bodybuilder, the old guy, the swordsman, the bounty hunter, and the supermodel? In order it was the Rakage, the Tsuchikage, Chijuro, Ao, and Mei. The men looked a little peeved at what the boy called them while Mei blushed slightly at being called a supermodel. In order, Minato explained, they are the Rakage, the Tsuchikage, one of the few remaining loyal seven swordsmen of the mist, an elite jonin from Kiri, and the Mizukage. Oh, Naruto said, sorry for the disrespect. Naruto, Minato said pushing Mei forward, is Mei Terumi, the woman I told you about. So, Naruto said looking at her, you're the girl my dad engaged me to when I was born, aren't you? Mei blushed slightly as she nodded. She had to admit for a boy who was much younger than her, he was quite handsome. Yes, she answered, Mei Terumi, the current Mizukage. Nice to meet you my dear, Naruto said kissing the back of her hand in a gentlemanly manner. So, Mei said, it seems so forward to do this but uh, would you like to get to know me better sometime? Sure, Naruto said smiling, how about tomorrow in Kiri around six? Okay, Mei said smiling, I'll see you then. Well, Minato said breaking the moment, I believe that you guys have been away from your villages long enough. By now someone has noticed you're gone. I believe it's time you guys got back. Before you go though, take these. He gave each of the three Kages a plumber's badge. You can use these to communicate with us, Minato said, now I believe our meeting has concluded. With that the three Kages and two Jonin vanished and reappeared in their respected offices with slightly sicker looks due to the fact that they still hadn't gotten used to teleporting and then smirked satisfied with the new alliance they had made. Oh make, how Minato reacted, version 2. So that's pretty much how my life has been, Naruto said to his recently resurrected father. Silence was all he got in response. Dad? 
When I get my hands on those good-for-nothing pig, beep, airs, I'm going to shove a kunai so far up there, beep, they'll be screaming OFR their mothers, then I'll shove bash them in, beep, ing nuts until they, beep, ing chirp. Wow, Naruto said, and I thought that red-headed girl from sound had a dirty mouth. Naruto examined himself in the mirror. He was currently wearing a white shirt with a black jacket over it with long blue jeans a pair of black sneakers. Today was his date with May. He was a little nervous seeing as he had never actually gone on a date before. After making sure he looked good, we went to the door and called out, Dad I'm heading out for my date. Don't wait up, all right. Minato yelled from his study, come back by midnight or I'll lock you out of the house. Naruto rolled his eyes at that. The young blonde then made his way to a small ship that would be his transportation for himself. It was basically a big ball with a thruster on the back with two winds on the sides. The cockpit opened and Naruto stepped in. The blonde then took the controls and took off. Meanwhile on Earth, Inkiri Mei was getting ready for her date. She wore an ocean blue dress that had a sea green sash around it. Her hair was out of its ponytail and cascaded on to her backside. She didn't have the makeup on her eyes, but she did have red lipstick. Soon she heard a loud noise as something landed in the front of her house. She stepped out and looked around to see a ship. The cockpit opened and Naruto stepped out. The blonde noticed Mei was standing nearby and that she was beautiful in that dress. Naruto couldn't help but stare at her for a few seconds. Mei walked over to him and then closed his mouth gently. Don't stare, Narukuan, the red head said teasingly, you'll trap flies. With that she walked off. Naruto then did a silent thank you to the kami and then went after his date. As soon as the two entered town, they were met with looks of jealousy and attraction from men and women alike. The men were attracted to Mei being she is in fact hot. They were jealous because she was on Naruto's arm. The women were currently attracted to Naruto since he was now handsome. They were also jealous that he had the mizukage on his arm. Both noticed and these were their thoughts. What the heck, does every man have a crush on Mei-chan? You can guess who thought that. I know you aren't looking at my date girl, you seriously don't need me to tell you which one of them thought that. The two entered a restaurant called The Golden Mist. The two sat down and waited for some service as they did they talked. So Naruto, Mei said, I'm curious. What were you like before this? Naruto shook his head and said, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Mei looked the blonde in the eyes and said, try me. The blonde chuckled and said, I was the loudmouth, dead last, who couldn't even perform a simple bushin. Mei stared at him incredulously. You're joking, the blonde laughed and said, not in the slightest. At that moment a waitress walked up and blushed at the sight of Naruto. What can I get you to, she asked, taking out a notepad. I'll take the sweet and sour chicken and a side of onajirai, rice balls, Naruto said handing the woman his menu. I'll have the chicken lo mein with a side of white rice, Mei said handing the waitress her menu. As the waitress walked away she leaned down to Mei's ear and whispered, Good choice, Mizukage sama Mei smirked as the two continued talking. He told her everything about his past save for the fact that he was hated by most of his village and the Kyubi. May could tell that he was hiding something, but she figured she could get the information out of his at a later date. She told him about the bloodline war that had been going on thanks to the Sande Mizuka Jugura. Naruto was disgusted that people would turn on their own, just because they could do things they couldn't and called them a demon. Then again, he was accused of being a demon due to a monster in his gut that was no longer there. As their meals arrived the two ate and continued to talk. I have to ask, Mei said as she ate, why did you leave your home village? Naruto swallowed the bite of an onajirai he had and said, it's a long story. Mei looked at him and said, we have time. The blonde sighed and said, the thing is about three years ago my teammate and, supposed best friend, tried to defect to Odo for power that was promised to him by some psychopath. Me and a few friends of mine went after him. 
He resisted, and I wound up fighting him while my friends fought with Samoto Nin, who were trying to aid him. We all won, but me and my friends were all injured. Make or maced, yikes. The blonde nodded and said, after my fight with my teammate I was taken in by my master, Merlin. In exchange for helping him with an experiment that gave me my powers I got training in them. The reason I never went back is because my teammate was the council's golden boy. They either would have had me executed or banished. At that Mei was curious and asked, why would they treat him like that? Naruto answer was short and sweet. He had the Sharingan. Mei's look hardened. And Uchiha, ha, huh, the girl said with disgust, you know about the clan? Naruto asked her with surprise in his voice. Yeah, Mei said, when I was a teenager I went to the Leaf and asked the Hokage if he could help us. He said no, because he didn't want to send his ninja into a war, that wasn't their problem. Anyway, on my way out I was approached by some Uchiha who thought I would be a worth a night. He was either drunk or stupid since he never noticed my headband. I believe he said, hey baby, why don't we head back to my place for some fun? He actually thought he had a chance. Naruto rolled his eyes, that guy must have been stupid. May continued, anyway, I said no, and he flashes his Sharingan, saying that I would be his pet soon. Good thing I was fast back then, because I drove the kunai into his eyes, and then using a lava jetsu burned his crotch. I made a point then, to the guys there and in my village, that I am no one's plaything. Naruto nodded understanding that. I hear you, Naruto said, due to some people in my village I can see why you wouldn't be taken seriously as a ninja. Most girl in the academy were just trying to get in the Echiha's pants. As the conversation concluded the two finished their meals, with Naruto paying, and the two heading off content. The two then went to a club and proceeded to dance the night away. During their dancing eyes were on them from the male and female patrons to workers. While they sat down to rest one of the female patrons walked up to Naruto. She was blonde, pretty well developed, and had sparkling blue eyes. From what Naruto could sense she was probably jonin in strength. He could also tell from the smell that she was slightly intoxicated due to the slight smell of sake on her breath even though there was the smell of a breath mint. Apparently she couldn't recognize Mei due to the fact that most of the lights were on the dance floor instead of the Hey baby, she said in a flirtatious voice, why don't you ditch this old crone and go out with a someone who doesn't need a pick-me-up? Naruto looked at her and said, how about no? The girl was shocked. No one had ever rejected her before. She growled about being denied and was about to try again when she felt a pair of eyes glaring at her. She turned to see the old crone and her eyes widened when she saw that the old crone was the Mizukage. She gulped slightly and left the two alone. I can't believe that little hussy, May growled. Easy now May chan Naruto said taking her hand, come on let's get out of here. The last thing I need is some drunk bachelor, trying to flirt with you. May raised an eyebrow and asked, why? Do you think I would leave abandon our date? The blonde chuckled, no, I'd probably end up turning the guy into a crystallized voodoo doll. May chuckled a bit and followed him out. Unknown to him, a lot of the males in the room heard what the blonde had said and paled at the that. The scene then fades and switches to a park in Kiri. Naruto was sitting on a park bench with his arm around Mei. The two were watching the stars twinkle and shine in the sky. Mei snuggled into Naruto's chest and said, I've got to admit this is one of my better dates near Kuen. Naruto smiled, good, this is the first time I've ever gone on one. Mei's eyes snapped open as she looked at the blonde incredulously. Really? she asked, I thought you would have done this plenty of times. Naruto looked at her and said, most of the female populace in my former village were turned into Uchiha fangirls, I wasn't into older women then, and most of the girls who like me other than you are fangirls. Mei smiled as she shifted around and sat in Naruto's lap and said, too bad they missed out. Mei then leaned in and puckered her lips. Naruto nervously puckered up and leaned in to kiss her, the two were less than an inch apart. Getting closer and closer. Beep. 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 
Mei and Naruto jumped at the sound, causing both of them to lose their balance and fall off the bench. Naruto groaned in frustration and growled, I knew I should have left this thing at home. The blonde pulled out his plumber's badge, which was the source of the continued annoying beeping. Oh man, Naruto groaned, I can't believe this. A map popped up showing three blips that were a few miles from their location. Sorry Mei-chan, Naruto said, but I'm going to have to cut our date short. Mei yelled, what? Why? Naruto said, apparently there are some of my allies in trouble, not far from here. How they got here I don't know, but I need to help them. Naruto started to walk away, but was grabbed by Mei, who had determined look on her face. I'm going with you, Mei said. Naruto would have protested, but he knew from the look in her eyes that there was nothing that he could say that would convince her to stay behind. You really plan on fighting in that dress? Naruto asked, Mei grinned before pulling out a scroll from who knows where. Then she was enveloped in a cloud of smoke, revealing her to be in a dark blue battle kimono. Naruto chuckled before placing his plumber's badge on his belt and pressing it. The blonde was then covered in his battle armor. Let's go kick ass, Mei-chan, the blonde said in a metallic voice, due to his helmet. The two then sped off toward the source of the signal. The sight that they came across was one that shocked Mei, but seemed normal to Naruto. The site consisted of large black, green, and slightly damaged ship that had landed in the middle of a clearing. Out of said ship stepped out, Ben, Gwen, and Kevin. Naruto deactivated his helmet and ran over to his friends with Mei at his side. Are you guys okay? Naruto asked as he helped them up to their feet. Yeah we should be fine, Gwen groaned as she was helped up. Yeah, Kevin groaned then, he noticed and said, so Naruto, who's the swimsuit model, in way too much clothing. Naruto sent a slight glare at Kevin and said, her name is Mei, and she happens to be my date. Mei looked at the Kevin and said, and if you continue looking at me like that young man, I'll melt your balls off. Kevin paled as he heard the threat and paled even more when he noticed the serious tone in her voice. Ben paled himself as he imagined that happening to him. Gwen just giggled at her boyfriend's reaction and started wondering if they should start doing that themselves. By the way who are you? May asked the three teens. Oh I'm Gwen Tennyson, Gwen said, this is my cousin Ben Tennyson, and my boyfriend Kevin. May smiled and said, Agaki love. When's the wedding? Kevin and Gwen blushed brightly before glancing at each other. Ben chuckled slightly as his cousin's and friend's misfortune. Naruto just chuckled at the look of embarrassment on their faces. It was at that moment that Naruto remembered something. What are you guys doing here anyway? The blonde asked his friends. We were testing out some new systems Kevin installed on our jet when we were attacked. We noticed a signal from a plumber's badge and headed here, Gwen said, attacked? By who against who? The blonde asked. His question was answered when there was a bright flash of lightning and five figures appeared out of the flash. There were three males and two females. The first guy had pale skin and had the body of a professional wrestler. If you could see the back of his head, he had what looked like a black and cracked fingernail. The second male was tall, slim, and pale as the first male. When he smiled, he showed his mouth was lacking a lot of teeth and his gums were slightly green. The first female was pale, like the two men. Her hair was in multiple tails, with black balls on the end. The second female had normal colored skin. She had long flowing silver hair, a pink suit that clung to her figure, and pink eyes. The last male was the oldest of the group. He had long black robes, pale skin, his face had black makeup on it to make his face look like a skull. In his hands was a staff that had an animal skull on top and a large gold ring in it. The blonde surveyed these people and said, Who are these guys? Ben got a serious look and said, The big guy is Thumb Skull, the thing one is, Acid Breath, the girl with the red hair is Frightwig, the girl with silver hair is Charmcaster, and the old guy is Hex. The blonde looked at the weirdos and said, Enemies of yours? Hex floated forward and said, Yes we are. Now I suggest you and the little woman step aside. 
This fight does not concern you. Naruto cracked his knuckles and said, That's where you're wrong, Grandpa. You attack my friends, it becomes my business. Now I suggest you back off, before you wind up throwing out a hip. Heck scowled at the young blonde, while everybody else couldn't help but chuckle, or in the girl's case, giggle. I'm starting to like this guy, Charmcaster said with a smirk. Hex turned and glared at his niece, before glaring at Naruto, and shouting, If you wish to join our fight, then I'll take care of you first. The old man then pointed his staff at Naruto, and fired a blast of energy. The blonde simply raised an arm. As the blast neared the blonde throughout his arm. To the shock of everyone around him the blast deflected off his arm and blasted a nearby tree. All of Ben's enemies stared with wide eyes and slacked jaws until they composed themselves. You're more powerful than you look boy, Hex said, but you are still no match for, dash. Bam. Hex was cut off in mid-sentence as the blonde slammed his fist into the side of the old magician's face. Shut up and fight already you old bag of bones. Naruto yelled as he ran after him. Hey pause of my uncle blondie. Charmcaster yelled as she ran after the boy. She was intercepted by a rope of pink energy wrapping around her and then throwing her away. Gwen kept Himana around her hands and then charged at the young sorceress. Acid breath let out a breath of toxic fumes at Ben, who was smart enough to move away as the fumes burned the ground. I'm going to burn you alive brat, the man hissed angrily. Unless I already am, Ben said as he toyed with the Omnitrix and then slammed down on the top. There was a bright flash of green and in Ben's place was a humanoid-shaped thing that was made of green slime and had a small UFO hovering over its head. Goop, the slime creature called. The creature of green slime then launched itself at acid breath and landed on the man's body, covering him. Acid breath then moved around wildly trying to shake off the slime that covered him. Kevin absorbed the earth turning to stone and was currently engaged in a boxing match with Thumbskull. Thumbskull was strong, but he wasn't strong enough to smash Kevin's stone armor. The two were currently standing in a grappling contest, with neither gaining ground. May was blocking Frightwig's hair tendrils when she caught one and then threw her over her shoulder slamming her into the ground. Frightwig got up in pain and said, Is that all you got you wretched old crone? Silence. Then everyone felt a huge amount of killing intent. Everyone turned to see Frightwig cowering in front of a furious May who was radiating so much killing intent she almost looked demonic. Who are you calling old you pale-faced, tentacle-haired freak? May roared in fury. Despite being young May was pretty sensitive about her age. When she first became Mizukage a younger woman thought that she would make a better Kage than her because she was younger than her. Needless to say the young woman had her but kicked halfway to Kumo. May launched herself forward at an incredible speed and then viciously punched Frightwig in the face. The pale villainess was sent flying and crashed thought a tree before losing consciousness. To everyone else it looked like May disappeared, reappeared, then Frightwig disappeared and an invisible force tore through a tree. Everyone was staring slack-jawed, at least until some broke out of their stupor. Goop sent out its gelatinous legs and connecting them firmly to the ground. The blob then twisted around and then started spinning taking acid breath with him. Acid breath screamed as his unexpected ride spun him around and around and around until Goop let him go sending him flying. Frightwig, who was just getting up, was hit and knocked out again by her fellow circus freak. Gwen blasted Charmcaster with an energy blast before tying a rope around her before lifting her off the ground and then slamming her into the ground at least three times before throwing her like a rag doll. Coincidentally she crashed right on top of Acid Breath and Frightwig. Kevin had butted Thumbskull before morphing his hand into a hammer and using it in a right cross that busted a lot of the circus freak's teeth. Kevin then grabbed him by the arms threw him as hard as he could. He landed on Charmcaster, who was just now getting up from her unexpected flight and crashed on the pile of villains, making a slight crater. Just the way I like M, May said, dumb, ugly, and out cold. Gwen used her powers to wrap the unconscious villains up in a chain made out of mana. Goop turned back into Ben and then said, What about Naruto? How do you think he's doing against Hex? 
The boy was answered when Hex came flying and landed a few feet from then with a groan of pain. The man was covered in bruises and cuts. He rose up using his staff as a crutch. Naruto appeared in a flash of yellow shocking May. When could he teleport? Ben asked as he hadn't see that move. Hiroshin, May muttered getting raised eyebrows from the kids around her. The what? Ben asked. The Hiroshin, May repeated, it's a move that allows the user to teleport as long as long as they have a unique seal. It was invented by his father. I didn't know he could use it. Back in the fight, Naruto was slowly approaching Hex. I suggest you give up no old man, Naruto said, I don't think you'll be able to last much longer in your current state, Hex growled and shouted, never. Naruto shook his head and said, I gave you chance and you threw it away. Your end will be quick. The blonde vanished from sight and unleashed a devastating combo on Hex before backhanding him away. The blonde then crouched down and began to focus. Hex rose up and his eyes widened as he sensed incredible power. He looked up and gasped to see white Cherka focusing in Naruto's right hand while black Chakra focused in his left hand. The blonde put both of them together and they merged forming a purple orb. The blonde held the orb out in front of him as it started to glow red before unishing and grabbing Hex by his robe and throwing him in the air before calling out, Ichibiko Imari. One-tailed menacing ball. A large blast of red chakra was fired formed the blonde's hands and hit Hex. There was silence before there was an enormous explosion that shook the ground despite it being in their air. Naruto calmed down and looked at his friends and ate. Kevin, Gwen, and Ben looked like they were going to try and dig up their jaws, which were currently so far down they were reaching the Earth's tectonic plates. May gave him a look that told him that he'd better explain or she would hurt him, badly. What just happened? Ben asked. And why did you have to kill him? Naruto shook his head and said, this is the way our world works. You fight an enemy you usually have to destroy him otherwise he'll just keep coming back again and again. The next time he'll probably be stronger than ever, or target somebody close to you. Besides just because I kill doesn't mean I like it. The three looked at him before nodding in understanding. They may not have liked the idea of killing, but it was how this part of the world works. Now I just have one question, Ben asked, how are we supposed to get home? Our jet is trashed. Naruto smirked before forming a clone. The clone then turned completely black with a few pieces of green circuitry here and there. The clone then jumped up and fused with the jet fixing it and turning it into a more advanced piece of machinery. The clone should last about an hour, the blonde said, now I suggest you get back home and fix this thing up. The three teens nodded before saying their goodbyes and getting on their ship. As they left Naruto faced Mei, who had a serious look on her face. She had her arms crossed under her chest and she didn't look too happy. Naruto, the girl said, explain, everything, now. Naruto let out a slight groan and then turned to face his date. The blonde then explained that he had been the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails, how he had been abducted and given power, how he was over 3,000 years old, and how he joined what was the equivalent of intergalactic ANBU. To say May was surprised was an understatement. She was floored. She looked like she was going to need to pick her jaw up off the floor. I take it, that's why you weren't really liked in your village, huh? May asked after a few minutes of silence. Yeah, the blonde answered, so what are you going to do now? Will you stay my friend or turn your back on me like most of the other people in my life? May walked up to the blonde and then gave him a warm tender kiss right on the mouth. Naruto's eyes widened significantly before turning back to normal and started kissing her back. The two held the kiss for a minute before breaking away. May let out a content sigh and said, you know what it feels like to be ostracized by others around you for something beyond your control. I'm not about to abandon someone who knows what we went through during the bloodline holocaust. Naruto smiled at her and then walked over and picked up Hex's staff, gaining a weird look from May. Trophy, the blonde explained with a smile. With that the two went back to May's house, where Naruto gave May a goodnight kiss, and the two went their separate ways.
As soon as May entered her room, she let out a loud whoop of success. She then fell down on her bed with a big smile on her face. Back with Naruto the blonde entered his home and was about to yell he was home when he noticed the time and figured his dad was probably asleep by now. The blonde stepped into the living room when the light came on showing Minato sitting in an easy chair with an expectant look. Well, the man said, how did it go? Naruto shook his head and filled in his father in on all the details of the date. The man smiled and said, that's my boy. And I see you got another trophy, the blonde smiled and said, yeah. Well, I'm going to put this with the rest of them. You might want to get to bed old man. The last thing we need is our lunakage dead, tired from waiting for his son, Tot get back from his date. The older blonde yawned and then, and then sat down and promptly fell asleep in the chair. Naruto shook his head and then grabbed a blanket, set it over his father. The blonde entered the basement. Inside were multiple glass tubes that had objects floating in them. The first one contained a large sword that was covered in large metal spikes. The second contained a large red three-bladed scythe. The third had five masks of different colors in it. The fourth had what looked like a pouch and a small biotic eye. The fifth was larger and was filled with different puppets each one holding out poison blades. The sixth held what looked like a body in black and white body with what looked like a Venus flytrap around his head. The seventh had a clay head. In its eyes were a pair of fully matured eternal Sharingan eyes. Below, it was an orange spiral mask with one hole in the front. The eighth held a long sword with a silver blade bandages wrapped around the handle a brown hilt with a blue crystal in it. The ninth held multiple coffins. A lot of them looked fancy, and some looked like they were thrown together in a hurry. The blonde smirked as he saw his trophies, before going over to the console and opening up a new one. The blonde walked over and put Hex's staff in a tube that came out of the ground. The blonde then walked upstairs, before turning off the light. Then he went up to his room and went to bed. Minato was sitting in his office. Naruto sat across from him. The two of them both looked as if they were in deep thought, so what are we going to do about this? Minato asked, the chunin exams are in a few weeks. Naruto rubbed his chin and said, we could bring in the plumber's kids and use them to compete. We can send suggestions to the daimyos to have the exams here instead of one of the other villages. Minato crossed his arms and asked, why do you want to do that? Naruto grinned slightly and said, I want to air the finals. More than likely Sasuke's ego will get the better of him. He'll probably challenge the Chimera to get more power. Plus, let's face it we need to get more humans up here. I'm not really comfortable with the fact that we live right next door to a giant bug. Minato thought this over for a minute. He knew that Kanoha would pay for its crimes one way or another he just had to find a way to do so. Naruto, Minato asked, didn't you say that you had connections with some very powerful people? A few weeks a tear in Konha. What do you mean they want to end the alliance with us? A civilian council member screamed. Various other cries, like that followed. Swanda rubbed her temples, to stop the oncoming headache. She had just received a letter from Suna saying that they wanted to end the alliance between the village. Somehow they got information about how Naruto was treated. With Gara being the current Kazakage and a good friend of Naruto, Let's just say his reaction was less than nice. The next blow came from Taki. Since they abused their hero and let an ungrateful brat take the credit for killing him they were pretty upset. Though they weren't as hostile as the Suna, they cut all ties. Next came Wave. Tazuin, whom Naruto helped, was currently mayor and broke all trade routes with Kanoha. Then they found out that the fire daimyo had gotten his hands on the same information. Needles to say the man was furious. He cut the village's budget by 50% until further notice. Quite obviously the civilian council was upset. The loss of their allies was causing their profits to go down and they were losing a lot of money. The clan heads just sat in silence. They had known that one day mistreating the Uzumaki would come back to haunt them all. Hokage-sama, you must do something about this, yelled another civilian councilman. 
I can't, Swanda said, my hands are tied. With the daimyo breathing down my neck, I can't do anything. This wouldn't have happened if you morons had fulfilled the Yandame's dying wish. Hokage-sama, Hamura said, there has to be some way to get everything turned back to normal. Swanda shook her head and said, we can't. Gara told me in his letter that any Kanoha Nin caught crossing the border without consent will be killed on sight. The same said with Taki, the letter from Wave said that they would have Kiri Nin ready to fight us. The council members hung their heads. The Shinobi clans were all thinking, I knew this would come back to haunt us somehow, with an added troublesome by Shikaku Nara. The civilian council was currently thinking, this is all that damn demon's fault. Just as the council was about to continue there came a tapping at the window. Everyone turned to see a large orb tapping against the window. Inoichi Yamanaka rose up from his chair, with a kunai drawn, and walked up to the window, he slowly opened it. The orb flew in and hovered in front of the Hokage's desk. The orb opened up to reveal a projector which roared to life. The machine projected the image of a man in robes. The man stood tall with a hat on his head that had the kanji for moon on it. Hello, the hologram said to the shocked council. Who are you supposed to be? Hamura asked the hologram. The man turned his head to the advisor and said, You may call me the Lunakage. Moon Shadow? Swanda asked, You're a Kage? The hologram nodded and said, Yes. Now let's cut to the chase. As you all know the Chinon exams begin in six months. Just recently, I have sent requests to the daimyos to have the exams in my village this year. To my surprise, they have accepted. What? Kohara yelled, it was supposed to be our turn this year. The Hulgrim turned to her and said, obviously they don't care. You really shouldn't take on forces that can easily kill you. Now then I sent this message to tell you this and to ask for the clan heads to come as well. Troublesome, Shikaku Nara muttered, why do you want us to come? The hologram looked at the pineapple-haired man and said, I think it would be better if you saw the fight with your own eyes. Plus, let's face it your wife will probably kill you if you didn't go. Shikaku shot up said, how do you know about that? The hologram answered, it's not that hard. From the bored tone I guessed you were a Nara. From what I hear the Nara women are quite vicious when they don't get their way. Shikaku kept his eyes on the hologram and sat back down. The hologram then turned to the Hokage, with the help of the projector, and asked, Do you accept these terms? Swanda thought for a minute. Despite the fact that their funds were down, she realized that they needed chance to show that the village wasn't weak. That and more than likely the civilian council would start complaining about it, and she didn't need that headache right now. We accept. A few days later, Naruto exited his ship. The blonde looked around and then entered the large warehouse. As they entered, he found Ben, Kevin, Gwen, and all the other plumber's kids. There were, however, two new faces, the first of which was a girl with blue eyes and black hair that looked just like Gwen. The second was a blonde girl with green eyes. As soon as Naruto entered the black girl, called out, Hello handsome. Ben grinned and walked up to the blonde and said, Hey Naruto. How have you been? The blonde grinned and said, Good, good. Listen you guys I need a favor. What kind of favor? Kevin asked, It must be pretty big since you called us all here. Naruto looked at the Osmosian and said, We'll get to that in a minute. First who are those two? The black-haired girl walked up with a sway in her hips and said, The name is Sunny, but you can call me the girl you've looked all over for. Naruto shook his head and said, Sorry not interested. Sunny's jaw dropped as she was rejected. The blonde then walked up to Naruto and said, My name is Eunice. Pleasure to meet you. Naruto extended his hand and said, same here. Now that we all know each other, Manny said, becoming impatient, why did you call us here? Naruto shook his head and said, in a few months there are going to be a series of tests in my village to determine who will rise up in the ranks. I have powerful forces, but I need ones that seem more human. And in all honesty, I just really want to send some of these Thames screaming back to their mommies. 
Sonny Grandin said, I like this guy. Pierce walked up the blonde and said, I understand that you need people that look human, but most of us don't. Naruto shook his head and said, You know, if Ben could fix those with genetic damage, why haven't you tried it on yourselves to where you can turn human? Pierce looked at Naruto for a second. The boy was silent before slapping his own forehead. How come we never thought of this before? Pierce asked out loud. Bean glanced at the Ultramatrix with a raised eyebrow. Ultramatrix, the boy said, scan area for human and alien hybrids. The Ultramatrix emitted a yellow color. Scanning everyone in the room. After the sand was over the Ultramatrix spoke. Multiple alien-slash-human hybrids detected. Warning. Scans show genetic imbalance between three of human-slash-alien hybrids. Shall we attempt to fix? Ben nodded and said, yes. The Ultimatrix glowed bright green before shooting off three beams of green light at Helen, Manny and Pierce. After a few seconds the glow died and revealed two new characters. Two because Pierce pretty much looked the same except that the spines on his body were gone. In Manny's place stood a tall African-American boy with no hair and brown eyes. He stood about a head or two shorter than Manny used to, and wore his gear including the robotic claw that replaced his hand. In Helen's place stood a young Caucasian female with short black hair and light green eyes. She stood bit taller than before due to a fact that her legs were bent like they normally were in her alien form. Manny and Helen looked at their now human hands. Manny recovered and yelled, Yeah man. Helen laughed happily at looking like she did before she turned into an alien. Genetic imbalance restored. Subjects now capable of switching between human and alien forms. Examination, new alien form added. Designation, porcupite. Powers, capable of launching spines from anatomy and using them in close-range combat. Note, ultimate form unavailable, porcupite? Helen asked, do you think that's what Pierce's alien is? Ben said, I think it might be. Now then, Naruto said, we have training to do. We need to be ready for the upcoming battles. What? Manny asked. Basically you need to be much stronger to fight who we're going against, Naruto said, don't worry I already sent your parents something to say you're going to be gone for a while. They were begrudging about Tid at first, but we reached a deal. All of them were skeptical at first, but then gave in. Okay then, Naruto said with a grin, let's go. Naruto took out a remote and pressed a button. In a flash of light, all the kids were gone. Seconds later, they all reappeared in what looked like a huge training area, complete with targets and dummies. Whoa, Cooper said, nice. Thanks, Naruto said, now then we need to adjust to your strengths and weaknesses. Sunny scoffed and said, I don't have any weaknesses pal. Naruto raised an eyebrow at the girl and said, yes you do little girl. Sunny glared at the blonde and said, don't call me little. Naruto gained a smirk and said, little, girl, Sunny's face turned violent. She prepared to fire at the blonde when he suddenly disappeared from sight. Sunny was then very aware of a fist connecting with her gut. The girl doubled over Naruto's fist. Naruto then grabbed her arm before lifting her off the ground and slamming her down on the ground hard. Naruto then placed his boot on her back and said, rule one of combat, never think your opponent is weaker than you. They may pull a dirty trick from behind their back. Naruto removed his boot and turned to the other plumber's kids. This is prime example of weakness, the blonde said in a lecturing tone, arrogance can make a person blind to a fighter's real strength. Believing you are the strongest can get you killed very easily on the battlefield. Everyone was at rapt attention. So what are our weaknesses? Manny asked. Naruto approached Manny. Your weakness Manny is that you're bullheaded. You are strong yes, but you rely too much on brute strength. That will only get you so far. You must learn to plan ahead and strategize. If you have a plan, come up with a backup and a backup for the backup. Naruto turned to Helen. Helen your speed is incredible, but using the same attacks with it makes you predictable. You must learn to change things UPS. 
we also need to work on your physical strength. Add that to your speed and you will be a force to be reckoned with. Naruto turned to Cooper. You, Cooper, rely on your powers too much. You need to gain skills in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You may end up in a situation where no technology is available. You would be a sitting duck then, learn how to fight without your powers. Naruto faced Pierce. You are a formidable fighter Pierce, but you get angry easily. You need to learn to control your temper. Other than that you're pretty good. Naruto face Alan. Carter you need to learn the full extent of your abilities. You are limited to only what you know. You need to fully learn to control your fire powers even in your human form. The blonde then faced Kevin. You Kevin are a very well-rounded fighter. Unfortunately, like Pierce, you let your emotions get the best of you from time to time, learn to hone them in, and you will find your strength greater than ever. Naruto faced Gwen. Gwen you need to learn to go past your limitations. You are afraid to unlock your full power, which is why you rely mostly your basic powers. You must not fear your own strength, you must learn to embrace it. Then you will become more powerful than ever. Finally, Naruto faced Ben. Ben, you rely on your ultimatrix for too much on the battlefield. When it runs out of power, you are a walking target. You need to learn to fight without the ultimatrix. Only use it when necessary, Naruto stepped back and said, Are we all clear? Everyone nodded. Hey how come I don't have a weakness? Eunice asked. Naruto shook his head and said, I don't have much information on you Eunice. I didn't know of you until recently. While we train I can figure it out along the way. For the plumber's kids the next six months were pure hell for them. After a day of trianning that exhausted them, they had to get up at like four in the morning. When asked why Naruto answered, it's morning. During the day they had grueling drills. They had to run 20 laps, do 50 push-ups, 30 crunches, and do 30 punches and kick for each limp on posts. All that was just the work out for physical abilities. When T.I. came to testing out their powers things got rough. Naruto made each of them learn their limits. Helen and Manny had to practice changing back and forth between their human and alien forms at will. This was a challenge in itself, since they weren't used to it. After a while, they managed to get it down with help from Alan. Naruto had Manny pumping iron until all four of his arms felt like jelly, and he had Helen run around at top speed for as long as she could before collapsed. During that time she had to dodge things rising up from the ground like spikes and trapdoors. Manny also had to learn patience and strategy by playing chess, checkers, and shogi. He became adequate at that as it took Naruto more and more moves to beat him. Naruto even replaced Manny's claw hand with a mechanical hand that had lasers in the fingertips and changed to three-fingered FORM when Manny changed. Naruto had Sunny teach Gwen more about her powers. By the time all the training was done Gwen could transform into an anodite, but she could only hold the form for about ten minutes or so. Kevin was learning to hone in his temper while fighting. During his training, Naruto noticed that Kevin needed time to absorb a substance. A bad thing was that when he did sometimes the right element wasn't at hand. To fix this Naruto designed a special belt for him that had packs on it that contained different elements in it. From stone to metal, to alien alloys. Kevin even learned how to absorb materials at a faster rate than before. Eunice learned Muay Thai and was found to be quite adept at it. Naruto was surprised to find that she was in fact one of Azimuth's experiments. After finding she could absorb DNA and gain special abilities from certain animals Naruto gave her a special belt like Kevin's except the packets contained DNA from different animals and even an alien or two. Alan had to discover the limits of his power. He found himself flying instead of the usual meteor thing. After a lot of crashes, he became very adept at it. He even discovered that he could generate intense heat and launch fireballs while still in his human form. Pierce learned to hone his skills and his anger. He found out that in his human form he could create spines on his hands and feet adding a little extra kick to his physical strikes. Cooper became adequate in physical combat. 
his strength was already on par with the human Manny. The boy found himself to be quite the accomplished boxer. However, so that he could still use his powers Naruto gave the boy a special staff. When Cooper focused he could turn it into a pair of swords, a scythe, and a spear all of which had high-frequency blades on them enabling them to cut through anything. Finally, Ben found himself learning kung fu moves. With help from Gwen in that department, the boy found himself to be very adept at the fighting style. So that Ben wouldn't be completely weaponless without the Ultimatrix in use, he gave the boy a pair of laser pistols that proved very effective in rapid-fire succession since they didn't require ammunition. However, they did overheat when used too much. At the end of the six months, Naruto grinned as he stood in front of the plumbers. All of them, instead of their normal clothes, had on special suits. The suits were black with white on the chest, shoulders, and on their upper legs. What was special about the suits was nanotechnology that gave the user special tools. The boots were capable of emitting special fields around them that allowed them to defy gravity. The nanotechnology also allowed the wearer to form a mask that covered their entire head with a white visor that didn't restrict their vision. The nanotechnology also allowed the suit to harden should the wearer be caught in a crossfire or has an explosive object thrown at them. The suit even came with a cloaking device to hide them from sight. Sadly, they could still be sniffed out by a Neen Ken. The last feature was something Merlin had built recently. The little alien called it a leash. The leash allowed the user to pull an object or person towards them. At the same time, the person was covered in the leash's energy, causing them to slow down temporarily. The leash was also able to slam a ball into the ground sending out a wave into the air and suspends them making them easy to take down. So do we all understand the plan? Naruto asked. We fight and we beat anyone we go against from your old village, Kevin said with crossed arm. Right, Naruto said, now then let's go meet the big man in charge. Naruto, and then others, then headed for Minato's office. Naruto entered to see Naruto, talking to Max Tennyson. Hey Naruto, the elder Namake said. Hey Pops, Naruto said. That's your dad? Ben asked, I thought you were an orphan. Naruto looked at him and said, I was. I'll explain later. Hey kids, Max said, how have things been going so far? Ben groaned and said, training was hell. Anyway, when are we having the tournament? Tomorrow, Minato said, you guys need a day to relax. In other words, you're free to mess around for a while. Enjoy yourselves, but don't get into any trouble. The last thing I need is a bunch of angry parents on my butt. Everyone laughed slightly. With that everyone left. Kevin with Gwen, Ben on his own, Manny with Helen, Pierce with Sonny, Eunice with Alan, and Cooper going on his own. Minato shook his head and said, Tomorrow, all hell is going to break loose. Meanwhile, in Kanoha, in an underground base. Danzo sat at a desk, with Hamura and Koharu by his side. Across from them stood a very large figure. So in return for helping you destroy your enemies you give us control over the earth, Danzo said as he narrowed his one visible eye at the figure. Yes, the figure said, but only upon evidence of my enemy's destruction. The figure stood up to his full height, towering above Danzo and the advisors. Do we have a deal? the creature asked. Yes we do, Danzo said as he held out his hand. The figure then reached out and shook Danzo's hand, nearly crushing it in the process. The creature then walked out creating echoing footsteps as it exited the base. Soon, Hamura said, this world will be ours. Koharu and Danzo nodded with smirks of their own. Naruto stood in front of his friends from the plumbers, with his arms crossed. So do we all understand the plan? Naruto asked them. We beat the snot out of anyone we fight in the Chinon exams, Kevin answered, and we make it especially painful if they're from your old village. Naruto nodded at Kevin. Now then, Naruto said, steal your nerves people the competitors will be here in a matter of hours. Oh, and Sunny, no picking fights with people this time around. Meanwhile on earth. Tsunade stood as she looked a piece of paper that had printed out of the small drone that had sent her the invitation. 
Around her were the contestants, Jiraiya, the Jonin, and clan heads. Where are transport? Sasuke asked aloud. Yeah, where are these idiots? Sakura said trying to get in good with her crush. The outburst caused a lot of annoyed groans to go through the gathered. Before Sakura or Sasuke could go on they became aware of a few figures approaching from the distance. They noticed that some of them were Jonin level ninja. There were however sights most of them knew. Five of the figures were wearing Kage robes. One for sand, one for rock, one for mist, one for cloud, and one for rain. Swanda, the Kage from sand said, it's been a while. Tsunade smiled and held out her hand saying, it's good to see you too Gara. So your Tswanda send you, Mei said with a smile, my name is Mei Turumi. The old guy is Anoki, and muscles there is A. Tswanda shook the Mizuka's hand and said, good to meet you all. I'm also glad to see the ladies get their due in another village. By the way what are you doing here? Mei smiled sweetly and said, we're here for the Chinon exams. We were given invitations as spectators in the Kage box. Sasuke scoffed and said, What Kage doesn't have any active ninja? Swanda, and everyone else, save Sakura, rolled their eyes at he arrogant statement. The foreign Kages all glared at the boy for his clear disrespect. For one thing, the Amakage said, My village, as well as Mist, just recently got out of recent war. And for future reference, just because we don't have ninja now, doesn't mean we won't have them later. An A and B U, who was with the Amakage, glared at the young Uchiha. You could feel a sense of annoyance and disappointment coming off of him. Jiraiya go a good look at the three for aim and a look of recognition crossed his face. Conan, the old sage asked. Conan smiled at the man and said, It's good see you Jiraiya senpai. Tsunade looked at Jiraiya with a surprised look. You know her? Tsunade asked. She was an old student of mine, Jiraiya said, shocking Tsunade. The busty Kage walked over to Conan and whispered, He didn't try anything inappropriate with you did he? Conan shook her head and answered, No. I have a bloodline that allows me to control paper. I told him that if he tried anything indecent, then he would know what it felt like to have a great deal of paper cuts on a certain part of the male anatomy. All the males who heard winced. The only exception was Sasuke. He was staring at the woman disdain. She had a bloodline jutsu. That mean they were jutsu he couldn't copy. Suddenly a smirk came across his features. All he had to do was charm this woman and she would be his. Maybe he could do the same with the mist kage. She was pretty hot. You said you had a bloodline, right? Sasuke asked Conan. The woman simply nodded. Well, Sasuke said, come with me then. Back in Kanoha, I can offer you much. The Amakage clenched his fists. The other Kanoha Nin were disgusted at the fact that Sasuke was trying to get into this girl's pants just because she had a bloodline. Sakura was pissed because Sasuke wasn't flirting with her. How dare that little rain by mob try to steal my Sasuke Kuen, she mentally raved. Conan knew what Sasuke was trying to do and simply scoffed at the boysal offer. She was about to tell him off wine, the amicage, strode up to Sasuke, grabbed his throat and lifted him to his eye level. Listen good boy, the kage growled his eyes flashing, I'm only going to give you one warning. Stay, away, from, my, wife. He punctuated each word by adding more pressure to Sasuke's throat. When he finished his threat, the threw Sasuke away. The boy landed on the ground hard and dazed. He rubbed his sore neck. The young Uchiha go tap and was about OT start yelling until a loud noise cut him off. Everyone looked toward the skies to see two large metal aircrafts coming down through the clouds. The first ship was large and gray and had two leg-like appendages coming off the back, Tetrax's ship. The other was large, black, and had a design that resembled circuitry, ship. The two ships landed. The first one opened up and a large hulking figure wearing black and gray armor with a green triangle in the helmet stood at the entrance to the aircraft. This is the hidden village group right, the man said his voice clear through the armor. In their shocked stupors everyone nodded. 
Good, the man said, all kages and bodyguards enter through here. All contestants use the ship on the left. Any questions? No? Good. The kages and their bodyguards entered the ship. The contestants entered the black and green ship. Once inside the contestants noticed something. There was no pilot. Uh, who's flying this thing? Kiba asked a little freaked out. Ship. Ship. Ship, answered a small mechanical voice that made everyone jump. Inside the Kage shop everyone had sat down in seats and rails that resembled the latches on a roller coaster came down. Much to his humiliation Anoki had to have a booster seat. Okay, the large metal man said, my name is Tetrax. I'll be your guide for today. Before take off I would like to point out that the seats have little red buttons on them. In the case of an emergency feel free to press aid button. You will then be ejected out of the ship. Don't worry there is a parachute. Thank you for your time and attention. At that moment, the engines roared to life and the ships took off. Formed their seats, the kages, and bodyguards screamed. Well most of them did. The crow mast ANBU didn't and neither did the amicage. In the contestant ship, they hadn't had such a talk, because they were too shocked about the ship talking. All the contestants were currently in pancake form on the rear of the ship. Eventually, the ships broke through the atmosphere. As soon as they did everything started floating. The contestants smiled in amusement as they started floating, even Sasuke. At least until the artificial gravity kicked in and they all fell to the ground with a loud crash. As the artificial gravity kicked in on the Kage ship the restraints on the ship release. We will be arriving at the hidden moon village in exactly 20 minutes, Tetrax said into a microphone that lead to the contestant ship as well. Until then, don't do anything stupid. In the contestant ship Sakura said to herself, must, resist, stupidity impulse. She took out a paddle ball and started playing with it. Not resisting well. After twenty minutes of Sakura mumbling to herself. Tetrax's voice came over the intercom and said, Attention all passengers, we are now approaching the hidden moon village. Please sit down and brace yourselves, for this might be a rough landing. Everyone braced themselves against something and both ships shook as they landed on the ground. As soon as the ships landed the doors opened revealing light gray earth. The group slowly exited the ships, they found themselves greeted by strange creatures with a banner that said welcome to the moon village. The Kages walked out of the ships. The Lunakage smiled behind his mask and walked up to the group. Welcome to our humble little village, the masked Kage said with a smile under his mask. Glad we were able to come, May said to the Kage, shaking his hand. Thanks for accepting my invitation, the Lunakage said holding out his hand to shake Tsunade's. Now then, the Lunakage said, the Chinon exams here work differently here. Instead of three parts there will be one part. All contestants will compete in a tournament against the fighters from my village. Your skills will be judged by Jonin from both your villages and the others. It will then be decided if you are ready to go to the next level. Understood? Sasuke smirked and said, You might as well just hand me a chin and vest now. The leaf mean rolled their eyes while the kages groaned at the boy's arrogant attitude. The lunakage walked up to the boy and glared down at him with angry eyes. Listen boy, the man said, no victory is guaranteed. If you pass, you pass. If you don't, too bad. With that the moon's shadow turned away from the arrogant boy. He turned to the important people and said, Come there is something we must discuss in private. As they left, he turned to the contestants and said, The tournament is tomorrow. Don't do anything to piss anyone off, and you'll be fine. With that the Kages, their bodyguards, the clan heads, and Jiraiya stepped on a pad and vanished in a flawless H of light. That was interesting, Sai said with a bit of curiosity in his voice. In the Lunakage's office. There was a flaw H of light and everyone appeared in the Lunaki's office. That was, interesting, Shikaku Nara said as he tried to gain his bearings. I think I lost my appetite, Chiza Akamichi said. Cool, Sumanazuka said with a smirk. You get used to it, the Lunakage said with a smile behind his mask. 
All right, Jiraiya said as the dizziness wore off, I got to get this off my chest. You seem familiar to me. I don't know Highway, but I think I've seen you somewhere before. The Lunikage sat at his desk and chuckled, Oh, you don't remember me? I'm hurt, Arosenin. Jiraiya gasped and asked, Naruto? The Kage shook his head and said, Right family, wrong generation. Minato then took off his mask and Kage hat to reveal the face of the revived Yandame Hokage, now Shodame Lunikage. Minato? Everyone gasped at the same time. Yep, Mianto said, now close your moths. They'll attract flies. How are you alive? Jiraiya asked with a shocked look on his face. Naruto made a deal with the Shinigami, Minato explained, in return for me coming back to life he gave her the souls of a great deal of powerful missing Nin. Namely Orochimaru and the Akatsuki. Swanda nearly reeled back when she heard that. You mean Naruto was the one who wiped Otogekure off the map, she asked. Yep, Minato said, he's not even my age and he's already more powerful than me. I'm so proud. Tsunade gained a serious look and asked, is he here? In the village? Minato shook his finger and said, now that would be telling now, wouldn't it? Tsunade grumbled to herself about annoying blondes and trying to get on her nerves. Is Naruto here in the village? May asked wondering where her boyfriend was. He is, Mianto said, but don't bother him. He's giving my fighters some last-minute training. Shibi Aburame approached Minato and said, I believe we are here for a reason other than just an examination of skills. The blonde in front of him gained a serious face and said, Yes. You all know that the Leaf Village has fallen from grace. The village itself is just a shadow of its former glory. In other words, the will of fire is pretty much all but gone. I brought you here to make an offer. Sim approached him and said, You want us to join the Hidden Moon Village? Minato merely nodded in confirmation. The clan heads seemed to think it over. The Hidden Leaf hadn't really recovered from its fall from grace. On top of that it had gotten a really bad re with the Fire Lord which made things much worse. In other words it only took them a few seconds to think. We're in, all of them said. Okay, Minato said reaching into his desk and taking out a transparent material with glowing words on it. All I need are the fingerprints of all the clan heads here and it is a done deal. The clan heads, one by one, placed their hands on the object. After it did a flash of their hand print appeared then their name. Now then, Minato said, there are some empty mansions on the east side of the village. You can set up there. We'll arrange for the rest of the clans to be transported up here within a few weeks. Now Highway don't you guys go and check out the village? Not you Amakijdano, I want to have a word with you. The Kages and the newly former clan heads of Kanoha all left except for the Amakij, his bodyguard, and his wife. So. Minato said as he eyed the amicage, you can take off the mask, now Nagato. The amicage took off his mask and then released the Jinjutsu on his eyes. His face was slightly pale and his hair was orange and spiky. His eyes were purple with a black dot pupil and multiple rings around his eyes. So how have you been, since you're beat down at the hands of my boy, the blonde Kage asked the Rinnegan bearer. Nagato gave a shallow smile and said, I've healed up, quite nicely. Nagato gained a slightly distant look as he remembered the incident. Flashback began. Nagato grunted in pain as he felt his flesh being cut. He struck the opposite wall with incredible force. He fell to the ground in incredible pain. He rose up to look at the armored face of the chimera. The armor slowly slid back to reveal the face of Naruto Namakase. Around them were the destroyed bodies of the Akatsuki and the destroyed bodies of his paths of pain. The only ones he could tell were still alive were Itachi and Conan. You, the man growled, the QB Jinchuriki. Naruto shook his head and said, Former Jinchuriki. The QB is dead. Nagato growled and said, My plan, ruined. Before he could go on mounds of crystal, shot up and pinned him to the wall. Naruto stepped forward his arm turned to complete crystal and electricity lined the rock-like material. 
He slowly made his way forward and drew back his arm before starting to swing forward. As the sharp object went toward his eyes, the Rinnegan bearer's eyes, he saw his entire life. His dark childhood in Ain during Hanzo's reign. The day they met Jiraiya. The death of his friends. The day his eyes awoke. The fights with the Jinchuriki and their deaths. He saw every life he took every drop of blood that was spilt in the name of peace. Nagato finally came back to reality here the crystal was stopped just an inch from his face. Is it true what they say? Naruto asked, Ife flashes before your eyes when you're about to die? Nagato only nodded. I know your goal behind this whole escapade, Naruto said, your dream was to create an everlasting peace. A valiant dream, but you went about it all wrong. You killed innocent people in the name of this dream. With your power, you could have brought them back. Nagato hung his head the dread of all he had done, finally caught up to him. What have I become? he asked. You've become what you've tried to stop, Naruto said, a dictator. A man wanting to rule through fear and pain. The crystals crumbled. Naruto slowly turned around and started to leave. As he did he said, look into your heart Nagato. You'll know what to do. Flashback end. Hey big guy, Minato said, I lost you there, for a second. The orange-haired man shook his head and said, sorry I was just having a flashback. Minato looked at him strangely and said, so how have you been Itachi? The crow-masked ANBU took off his mask, revealing the face of the Echiha clan murderer. I have been fine, the elder Echiha said. So, Minato said turning to the Amakage, how are the Jinchuriki doing? Nagato answered, they are adapting well to life in the village. They were a little nervous after the resealing, but they adapted. They are also learning to control their bija quite well. They can go at least a half an hour before the consciousness of the bija starts to influence them. Minato smiled and said, I'm glad to hear it, now then why don't we celebrate? I know this restaurant on the west side. The food may be strange, but it is in fact delicious. Nagato shrugged and said, when in Kiri. The next day. Bright lights shone in the sky as the spectators made their way to the arena in the middle of the village. A few residents made their way to the arena and took a spot in their seats. There was a special box with the kanji for moon. In this box sat the kages and their bodyguards. Minato, disguised again sat in between the group. In the box next to them was the spot made for certain people. Your seats are this way sir, said a plumber agent while guiding Mr. Tennyson to his seat. As Mr. Tennyson made his way to the seat he found that he among other parents were there. Hey honey, his wife said as she got up and kissed his cheek. What are we doing here? Mr. Tennyson asked. I heard something about our kids competing in this tournament, an African-American woman said. Really? asked a Caucasian woman with dark hair, I heard the same thing about my daughter. After a few minutes, Minato stood up and said, Welcome all spectators of Earth and beyond. As leader of this city, I welcome you to this tournament. Those who win, or those who show exceptional skill, will be promoted to the rank of Chunin. For those of you who don't know how this works, check the pamphlet under your seats. A great deal of aliens searched through pamphlets and surprised murmurs went up through the crowd. Now then, Minato said as the murmurs died down, please turn your attention to the large holographic projector in the middle of the arena. The names of the contestants will be announced there. For those of you who are gambling men, place your bets. And for future reference I will not be taking complaints about fights being rigged. Now then, let's get started with the first match. The holographic projector started randomly going through fighters from Kanoha and Luna. It landed on one figure and a deep voice said, Rock Lee. Lee smirked before he jumped down from the Kanoha fighter's box and landed in the arena. The screen cycled through more figures until it landed on a picture of a moon fighter. Tiny, the contestant from Moon, gave a slight laugh under his armor and jumped down from the fighter box into the arena. What made this one stick out was the fact that he had four gun holsters on his back. 
As the two landed two large rings began to spin around the arena forming a dome that was made to protect the bystanders should any attacks get out of hand. Holographic images started to rise up off the ground until what looked like a black arena with large pillars formed. Incredible, the earthlings thought, except Hose who knew of this technology already. Lee was staring around him in awe until he heard the sound of Tiny cracking his knuckles. Tyne smirked under his mask and said, You're going down, little man. Lee simply grinned, flashing his bright teeth, and said, You talk big. Let's see how you back them up. With that, the two contestants charged at each other. Lee started off the battle by charging at Tiny. The muscular teen dodged to the right to avoid the powerful punch. Tiny then caught Lee's arm by the wrist, lifted him up off the ground, and then slammed him down hard. Almost immediately, Lee bounced back up and spun around Don his hands, extending his legs, catching Tiny in the stomach, knocking him off balance. Not bad for a little runt, Tiny growled, but you'll have to do better than that to beat me. Tiny charged at Lee, who charged back at him. The two met, both unleashing vicious haymakers that connected with each other's faces. The crowd winced, respectively, at the sight of the blows landing. Go Lee! Guy yelled, show him your flames of youth. An alien, who was near Guy, looked at the man with a strange look on his face. Is there something wrong with that guy? He muttered. Karinai, who heard the creature, answered, the doctor still don't know. I'm betting he got dropped on his head when he was young, or something along those lines. Back in the fight, Lee and Tiny were exchanging blows. It wasn't a fight right now, it was more of a slugging match that you'd see in a boxing ring. After taking a particularly hard shot to the shoulder Lee jumped back and started to unwrap the bandages around his arms. Tiny knew what that meant as Naruto had briefed all of the moon fighters on the tips that they were about taught use a very powerful move. Tiny smirked as he activated the cloaking feature on his suit. Lee's eyes got even wider than usual as he saw his opponent vanish as did the Earth Ninja. Lee looked around to try and find his opponent. The boy was then doubled over by a strong shot to the stomach. The strike was followed by a punch to the face that knocked him to the ground. He was ten lifted up off the ground and thrown into one of the pillars. Wow, said his African-American woman up in the box, that boy really knows how to fight. I don't know why, but I feel very proud of this. The lunakage turned to the woman and said, you should, he's your boy. Lee snarled as he rose up from the ground. Being thrown into the pillar had kicked up some dust. He grinned as he saw the vague outline of his opponent. He charged forward and slammed his fist into Tiny's stomach, making him double over. Tiny faded into existence and was then bashed away by Lee's right foot. From the sidelines Ben, in his armor said, Well Lee's dead. Ten Ten, who was standing near the man asked, What do you mean? The man smirked under his mask and said, Cause now Tiny, is mad. In arena, Tiny snarled angrily before rising up. That's it you jumpsuit wearing weirdo, Tiny snarled, I'm gonna beat you into the ground. Manny threw back his head and roared. To the shock of everyone of Earth, from the elemental nations, to be precise, looked on in shock as Manny grew to about twice his normal size, and an extra pair of arms burst from his extended rib cage. The mask formed a second visor over his second pair of eyes. Tiny slammed all four of his fists together and said, Come on little man. Let's see what you got. Lee gulped slightly before he charged forward and tried to slam his fist into Tiny's stomach. Unfortunately, Tiny armor hardened a few seconds before impact. Add that to the tetraman's natural armored skin and thick muscle structure, Lee wound up with a broken hand. Lee clutched his broken hand. Then he stared up in fear at the gargantuan brawler standing before him. Tiny cracked his knuckles, before drawing back both his left arms and unleashing a pair of hook shots that knocked Lee off his feet and slammed him into a pillar and straight into the world of the unconscious. Winner, Tiny. People and aliens alike cheered as they the fight ended. Tiny returned to his normal state and crossed his arms. Now on to round two, the lunakid said. The projector went through a few more cycles, before landing on two names. Velocity. Shikamaru Nara. Shikimaru got into the arena, to find himself facing against a woman, 
Oh great, Shikimura groaned, I got to fight another girl. What a drag. Velocity, Helen for those of you who can't figure it out, let out light snarl to herself as she heard that. The field flashed and then changed into a large grassy field. Ready? Fight. Just as Shikimura was about to go through hand signs for a jutsu, Helen tensed her legs and vanished from sight before reappearing and slamming a fist into Shikimaru's throat making him stumble back clutching his throat. The girl then unleashed a combo to certain spots on the boy's body making him fall back with little to no feeling in his arms. Velocity then landed on top of the lazy genius and unleashed a barrage of high-velocity kicks that, no doubt, cracked a few ribs. Shikimaru clutched his chest in pain before Velocity grabbed the boy by the throat before whirling around at a high speed and throwing the boy away with him landing outside the ring. Winner, Velocity. The crowd cheered again. However, they were less than enthusiastic than they were about the last fight since it was pretty much one-sided. Shikimaru was taken to the infirmary to take a look at his ribs to see if any had broken. Well that was a pretty dull match, Kevin muttered while watching. The others couldn't help, but not at that. Well what do you expect? Ino asked, Shikimaru has always been completely lazy. That's probably why he didn't even try to fight back. The projector went through more names before landing on two more names. Sakura Haruno Prototype Sakura grinned arrogantly as she walked into the arena. The Luna fighter walked into the ring. What stuck out about her was the fact that she had these packs on her belt. You might as well give up now you little brat, Sakura said with a smug tone, I'll mop the floor with your black and white butt. Prototype rolled her eyes behind her mask. Naruto had told her that two of the individuals from the leaf would be particularly arrogant and annoying. Apparently she found one of them. Prototype and got into a fighting stance while Sakura did the same. The rings formed what looked like the Roman Colosseum. As soon as the signal to start the fight was given Sakura charged at Prototype with the intent to end the fight with one blow. The woman touched one of the packs on her belt and she flashed green for a second. Just as Sakura was about slam her fist into the Luna Kunoichi's head when she simply jumped upwards, just as the pink-haired girl's fist created a huge crater in the ground. As Luna came down, she unleashed a powerful heel kick to the pink-haired girl's large forehead resounding in a loud crack. People in the audience winced at the sound of the impact. Prototype pressed another packet and grabbed Sakura in a bear hug. She then started to squeeze until Sakura was a dark blue color. The young woman then performed a wrestling move and slammed Sakura's forehead into the ground. As soon as Prototype let go Sakura fell to the ground unconscious. Weakling, Prototype muttered to herself as she was declared the winner. The pink-haired nuisance was then take off the field to see if she had a concussion from the impact, though not very many people were holding their breath over the fact. The projector cycled through more names. Thorn. Chuji Akamichi. Chuji cracked his knuckles while his opponent stood in front of him. There weren't any remarkable features about this one. As the fight began Chuji charged at his opponent. Thorn dodged to the side to avoid the meaty fist aimed at his head. He responded with a few well-aimed strikes to Chuji's abdomen. The chubby boy took a few steps back before throwing out another fist that Thorn narrowly avoided. What the Luna Ninja didn't expect was a knee to the Sotmok followed by a right cross. Chuji charged at his supposedly down opponent only to jump back when a series of large spines shot out of the fighter's back. Thorn spun on his heel and fired a bunch of spines from his hands. The chubby fighter found it hard to avoid all the spines because of his wide form. As a few made contact Chuji narrowed his eyes. Chuji focused his chakra in on his arm. Expansion Jutsu, left arm. Chuji's arm grew to an enormous size shocking all the aliens present. Chuji unleashed a vicus shot with the enlarged body part. Thorn hardened his armor allowing him to withstand the impact, if only just barely. The boy then threw out a kick that knocked back Chuji's arm and knocked him off the ground. The Luna Ninja then fired a leash of blue energy from his left hand that caught Chuji and ripped him forward. A blue glow surrounded Chuji and he seemed TOS low down in mid-flight. Thorn took advantage of the moment and then charged. 
He grew up a few spines on his knuckles and started to beat down on Chuji. After a few seconds Chuji was sent flying back and hit the ground with a loud crack. Chuji reached into a small pack and took out a pill. He swallowed it and was still for a moment. The boy twitched a bit before his muscles bulged and a few veins popped. He threw back his head and let out a primal roar. Thorn backed up a bit before regaining his composure. He formed a few spikes on his hands before charging at the newly formed berserker. The pair met and fists flew. Their arms were moving so fast that the audience could actually see after images of their arms. Everyone could hear the sounds of impacts as the fight went on after a few minutes of fighting they backed off. Sadly for Thorn, he didn't harden his armor. What some people didn't know about porcupites, Thorn's race, was that their spines have a small poison in them. It isn't deadly, but if enough is injected into someone it can cause them to lose consciousness. Sadly for Chuji he had enough. Thorn lost consciousness from the pain of the brawl, while Choji lost consciousness due to the poison in his system. Well, the lunakage said A.S.T. he two fighters collapsed, the fight is a draw. The two unconscious fighters were lifted off the ground by paramedics and taken away. Chizu left his seat to go see his son. Shikaku decided to do the same thing. One reason, because he wanted to see his if his son was okay. The other one being that if his wife found out that he didn't she would personally rip his arms off and shove her frying pan of doom up his butt. The projector cycled through a few more names. Ten Ten Higarashi. Cyber. Cyber jumped up into the ring and cracked his knuckles and pulled out a staff. Ten Ten jumped into the arena and started twirling a kunai in her hand. The male approached her and held out his hand saying, May the best fighter win. Ten Ten shook it and said, I plan on. The arena changed into what looked like an armor. Axes, swords, spears, and other weapons were set up on racks. Ten Ten smirked, thinking that this was the ideal spot for her. Cyber cracked his knuckles. Fight. The pair immediately launched themselves at each other. Cyber throwing out a blow with his staff, Ten Ten ducked and swung around. She tried to nail him in the side with a kick, but before she could strike him the armored boy swung his around and slammed his fist into the side of her jaw. The woman rolled backwards and caught herself before she suddenly ripped out a scroll and unsealed a katana. Cyber smirked under his mask before breaking his staff in two. The two poles shrank before a pair of narrow blades shot out and started to glow with a light hum. The pair charged at each other again. They stopped after a second and stood on the other side of each other. There was a brief silence before Cyber cried out. A small gash appeared across his chest. Ten Ten grinned before her sword suddenly went in half and it fell to the ground with a clatter. The woman stared down in shock at her sword. Suddenly a blue leash connected with her back and she was ripped from her stow and connected with a strong punch to the stomach making her fall to the ground. The girl shot up from the ground and glared at Cyber, who was no doubt smirking behind his mask. The woman suddenly grabbed some of the weapons off the racks and threw them at the boy. The young man simply jumped away from the multiple weapons. After dodging a few dozen weapons, the visor on his mask flashed blue before the weapons flying at him suddenly stopped in midair. Ten Ten gasped in shock before the boy clapped his hands together, sending the weapons flying at the girl. The then reconnected his swords forming the staff again. The charged and slammed his heel into Ten Ten's stomach, making her double over. Ten Ten righted herself and delivered a sharp uppercut. Cyber stepped back before unleashing a kick that knocked Ten Ten backwards a bit. Ten Ten then got hit with a strike to the temple and became disoriented. As she tried to gather her bearings, she was hit in the face with a cyber staff. The girl fell backwards and then collapsed onto the ground out cold. Cyber then fell to his knees breathing hard as he was declared the winner. The projector started running through names again. Ino Yamanaka. Sun. Sun stepped into the ring. She had a feel of complete and total confidence about her. Ino stepped into the ring and smirked at her enemy. She thought she had this in the bag. All she had to do was use her family jutsu, and it would be the end of the fight. 
As the fight was started Eno started to go through hand signs. Just as she finished, Sun appeared right in front of her before backhanding Eno, sending her flying into the wall. Eno was about to get up when Sun appeared above her in a flash of pink. The masked woman then unleashed a brutal beat down. People gasped at how brutal this woman was. By the time a few aliens had ripped the woman from Eno, the platinum blonde had a broken nose, a busted lip, a few cracked teeth, and a few cuts on her face. People looked a little scared of her brutality, while one person scolded her with a look. Well then, the lunakage said, due to some unexpected brutality, we shall be taking a short intermission for about 20 minutes. You may take this time to make some new bets, use the bathroom, and etc., be back in 20 minutes. With that everyone went to do what the Kage mentioned. The fighters from Kanoha and Luna went to different areas. Except for Sasuke, who tried to follow the Luna fighters. Once the Luna fighters were out of the arena, they started congratulating the winners of their fights. Did you have to be so brutal to the blonde Sunny? Gwen asked her cousin. Yeah, the woman answered, I know I'm gonna get chewed out by Grandma Verdona later, but it was worth it. A male voice then said, it had better have been worth hurting one of my friends. The group turned to see Naruto, in his chimera armor who didn't look very upset. I wanted you to make them hurt slightly, Chimera growled, I didn't mean for you to beat her to death. When this is over you, me, and your grandmother are going to have a long talk about how you behave little girl. If Sunny didn't know that Naruto was so deadly, she would have made some smart remark. Now she knew better. Yes sensei, Sunny said a little nervously. So you're the one who taught them, an arrogant voice said. Naruto sweat dropped behind his armor as Sasuke made himself known. What do you want boy? Naruto asked, not in the mood. I want you to teach me, the arrogant boy said. Naruto raised his eyebrow and asked, why should I? The boy answered, I'm an Achiha. I deserve that kind of training. Chimera stormed up to Sasuke and said, tell you what, why don't we make a deal? Sasuke raised an eyebrow and asked, what kind of deal? Chimera answered, as the final match you can fight me. If I win, you don't get anything. You win, I will train you. Sasuke grinned and said, deal. Sasuke walked away, assured of his victory. You're gonna decimate that guy, Sunny said with a smirk. I intend to, the masked blonde responded, smirking behind his mask. Sasuke grinned arrogantly as he looked out at Chimera, who was talking with his students. What's with you Uchiha? Kiba asked. Just looking forward to my upcoming fight, the young Uchiha said. After a few more minutes of waiting, the lunakage spoke. Okay on to the next match. The machine cycled through more names. Kiba Inazuka. Osmosis. Osmosis, got in the ring, cracking his knuckles. Kiba got into the arena with his dog Akamaru. Big dog, Osmosis said, what do you feed those animals? Kiba shrugged and sighed, mostly the right stuff. Plus he was part wolf. That might have had something to do with it. Osmosis shrugged as the arena set itself to look like a canyon. Kiba launched himself at Osmosis, who dodged to the right to avoid the Kiba's claws. He then had to perform the limbo, to avoid a mouthful of teeth, courtesy of Akamaru. The older half-alien then unleashed a quick punch to Akamaru's nose, knocking him backwards slightly. As the large ninja dog stumbled Kiba, jumped up and tried to slam a fist into Osmosis' jaw. The man grabbed a pack on his belt and a layer of metal covered him. Kiba's fist impacted the metal and there was a loud crack. Kiba cried out in pain and backed away clutching his broken hand and bleeding knuckles. Osmosis drew back his ARM and unleashed a powerful punch that knocked Kiba's jaw off the hinge and sent him flying into a rock. Akamaru roared seeing his master fall and charged at the Luna fighter. Unfortunately for him Osmosis formed a large metal fist on his hand and threw out a powerful right hook that broke a few of the dog-slash-wolf hybrid's teeth and knocked him off his feet and onto the ground. The animal tried to get up, but the Luna Ninja's arms morphed again forming large rings that wrapped around the dog's legs immobilizing him. Winner, Osmosis. Osmosis, let the dog go.
The dog sent a look to the man before he picked up Kiba and walked away. Before long, it was being lead by medics to get itself checked out. Good thing that the lunakage had sprung for a few veterinarians, too. The machine cycled through some more names. Shino Aburame. Light Wave. Shino got into the arena along with a female fighter. You look like you try to understand everything that's been going on, Light Wave, Gwen, said. I am trying to understand how you and your comrades have so many different powers. Shino admitted, you wouldn't believe us even if we told you, Light Wave said getting in a stance. The arena shifted to a normal-looking forest. Bugs immediately swarmed out of Shino's hands and attacked Light Wave. The young woman formed a shield of pink energy around her deflecting the chakra, draining insects. The pink energy then launched forward and encased the swarm in a bubble. She must be related to that sun girl, Shino thought. He was cut out of his musings when Light Wave launched a pair of pink discs at him. The Aburame air dodged the disc, but wound up getting hit in the face when the young woman intercepted him and started unleashing a fury of attacks. The young Aburame had a weakness for taijutsu and didn't stand a chance in the up-close fight. Light Wave suddenly threw up a kick that knocked Shino upward before forming pink energy bonds and then slammed him onto the ground. Shino struggled against his bonds, but they were to no avail. He sighed in defeat before hanging his head. Winner, Light Wave, roars from the crowd rose up. The arena turned back to normal and the pink bonds released Shino. The machine above them cycled through more names. Sigh. Inferno. The boy got into the arena with his large fake smile. Inferno got up and stood across from him. Inferno said, you better put up a better fight than the rest of these punks. The emotionless boy nodded and said, I intend to. The arena turned into what looked like a cornfield. Sai whipped out his sketch pad and instantly formed a trio of large tigers from his pad. Whoa, Inferno said, that is pretty cool. Sai merely nodded before sending his tigers at the boy. Inferno's hands burst into flames before launching a volley of fireballs obliterating the ink monsters. Sai rubbed his chin and said, Interesting. Try this on for size. He pulled out his pad and a flock of birds burst outward from it. The swarm of birds flew down at Inferno, who dodged to the right. He had a good reason to because the corn that they went through was sliced to pieces. The flock performed a quick U-turn to come back again. Inferno slammed his fist onto the ground and a flaming rock burst from the ground. The Luna fighter rose up from the ground and flew up toward the flock of deadly ink animals. As they neared, he quickly burst into flames, turning into a humanoid creature made of lava rock and flames. The sudden heat wave eviscerated the birds. Sai was about to take out his pad again when a sudden heat wave made him lose his concentration. When the emotionless brunette was then knocked off his feet by a superheated punch that made him cry out in pain, the transformed inferno fired another blast of flames from his hands that surrounded the remaining member of Team 7. The young boy lost consciousness due to the incredible heat around him. As soon as he was on the ground the flames died and inferno turned back to normal. Winner, Inferno. Cheers erupted from the crowd. In the stands, the Jonin were impressed. I have to say whoever trained these kids trained them very well, Asuma said. Yeah, Enko agreed, I'd hate to be the one to fight their sensei. Kakashi actually looked worried. If these guys were so strong, how would Sasuke fare? He shook that thought from his head. Sasuke would flatten the others like the insects they were. As if they could actually sense his thoughts, the other Jonin groaned and sweat dropped. Ladies and gentlemen of Earth and beyond, the Lunakage said gaining everyone's attention, due to an unforeseen circumstance the next match will be two-on-one. The remaining fighters from Kanoha Niji and Hinata Hyuga will face against the final members of my squad morph. Hinata and Niji looked at each other. On the Luna member's side a boy with a green object on his wrist and a pair of guns on his waist looked a little bit nervous. Easy there Ben, Naruto, slash Chimera whispered, keep your eyes on both. Only use the Ultimatrix if you have to. Also don't hurt them too badly. 
If you do, I'll do the you what Verdona is going to do to Sunny when this whole thing is over. Morph gulped slightly as the three fighters entered the ring. This guy is going to have a tough time, Karina said. I know, Guy said, but none of these fighters have been ordinary so far. I wonder what this one is capable of. In the ring Hinata and Niji activated their Byakugan and got into their family stance. Morph took out his guns and pointed the at the two. The arena shifted to what looked like a normal dojo. The two Huga charged, intent of striking the boy first. Morph fired his guns at the ground in front of them tripping them up. That was all the opening that was needed. Morph fired the leash from his arm and grabbed Hinata with it pulling her in front of him. He then kicked her away with his boot sending her into Niji, who tried to get a shot at him. The two crashed together before rolling apart and getting back in their stance. You are better than I thought, Niji said. Thanks, Morph said before aiming his guns again. The two Huga charged again. Morph tried his same tactic, but Hinata whipped out a kunai and threw it knocking the gun from the boy's hand. Niji then got in close and nailed the boy in the shoulder with a gentle fist strike. Ben recoiled from the strike and then had to avoid a flurry of strikes from Hinata. Luckily for him, he managed to activate the hardened state of his armor, so the pain was minimal. Morph grabbed Hinata's hands in mid-strike before he kneed her in the stomach knocking the wind out of her. He gave her a vicious head but, with his still hardened skull, making the woman back off obvious disoriented. Niji came up and tried to hit him, but Morph threw his leg out backward, making Niji divert his course. Hinata quickly recovered and nailed a kick to Morph's side. Moff was then knocked away by a powerful kick to the stomach. The boy rolled before stopping. He slowly rose up to see the pair going through hand signs. Hinata, water style, water bullet. Niji, earth style, earth bullet. The pair launched a ball of water and stone from their position at the prone figure. Morph reached for the dial on his wrist and turned it. The attacks hit sending up a large cloud of smoke and debris. In the special people booth Sim turned to Hayashi and said, I thought you didn't want to use Jutsu with your style. Hayashi sighed and said, After Niji's defeat at the hands of Naruto, I realized how flawed the style was. I realized anyone who has fought the Hyuga style long enough can learn how to counter it. I managed to persuade the council to change the style and allow Jutsu, but they are still too stubborn about the whole main house branch house thing. Down in the arena Niji and Hinata looked at the spot where Morph had been. Their guard was up because they were expecting almost anything to happen. When the smoke cleared it showed a large hole. The ground cracked and large green vines wrapped around them. The out of the ground rose a plant creature that walked of four vines with one head in between the two halves of, what looked like, a Venus flytrap with one big blue eye on its head, an eye on each shoulder, and long arms with large hands. It also had six large black buds on its back. Wild Vine, the creature said. Wild Vine then proceeded to slam the two Huga together and then hard into the ground. Finally the plant man slammed them into the ground. The pair got up just as the creature took two buds off its back and threw them to the ground. The objects exploded, sending a smoke everywhere. Hinata and Niji stumbled a bit before falling to the ground asleep. Winner, Morph. In a flash of green wild vine was replaced with Morph, who had his arms crossed. Now, the lunakid said, the final match that most of you probably wanted to see. The final match will be between the leader of my fighters Chimera and the so-called demon slayer of Kanoha Sasuke Uchiha. Again, look at the pamphlet if you don't know what I'm talking about. The pamphlets were opened again and muttering was heard through the crowd. Sasuke smirked arrogantly as he stepped into the ring. Chimera stepped in and cracked his knuckles through his armor. You might as well give up, Sasuke said, this fight is as good as mine. An alien sitting next to Kurinai said, what an unpleasant boy. Kurinai nodded and said, tell me about it. The arena shifted to what looked like the main courtyard for a temple. Sasuke activated his Sharingan, thinking it would give him the edge in the fight. Chimera charged at the deck-haired boy. Sasuke shot forward with the intent of ending the fight. He grew shocked when Chimera disappeared from sight and his powerful eyes couldn't follow him. 
the armored man appeared behind him with a katana in his hand. The masked warrior swung it forming a huge gash across the Echiha's back. Sasuke cried out in pain before rolling forward with a grimace of agony on his face. Sasuke turned his glare to Chimera. The armored man flared his chakra suddenly and flushed it outward. To Sasuke, it looked like someone had set off a bunch of flash bombs. Sasuke deactivated his eyes and said, I don't know what you just did, but I don't need my eyes to beat you. Sasuke charged again. Chimera lazily dodged. As this continued Asuma said, genius. Anko looked at the smoker and asked, what do you mean? Asuma explained, you see Chimera send out a flux of chakra so precise that it prevents Sasuke from using his so-called god's eye. When he heard that Kakashi looked considerably nervous. Well if you can look nervous with most of your face covered up by a mask and your headband. Back in the fight, Chimera was lazily slapping Sasuke's punches and kicks aside like they were a bunch of annoying insects. In a sense they actually were. Stop toying with me. Sasuke roared angrily. Chimera simply caught the next punch before throwing the duck-haired boy over his shoulder. The last Uchiha landed on his butt. He growled in annoyance. He rose up and then glared at the back of the man's head. The boy went through hand signs and lightning formed in his hand. Stop messing with me you son of a whore. Sasuke roared as he formed a chidori. In the Kage box, the lunakage let out a low snarl at the insult toward his wife. Sasuke charged forward with his most powerful technique. Naruto scowled in annoyance before he caught the offending limb and then broke it. Sasuke screamed out in agony. He clutched the now broken appendage and glared daggers at the man with his eyes still active. I'm an Uchiha, Sasuke growled, there's no way I'd ever lose to some no-clan loser like you. Chimera chuckled, Sasuke you couldn't beat me before. What makes you think you can beat me now anyway? Sasuke looked confused and said, what are you talking about? Chimera smirked under his armor before steam burst out from the upper part of his neck. The armor receded revealing a familiar face. Naruto, Sasuke said in shock. The rest of the Kanoha ninja stared in shock themselves. Kakashi was now hiding his anger. The demon was still alive. The silver-haired man discreetly made hand signs and brought down his chakra so that nobody would be able to sense him. As he did however only the Kages were able to sense him. The Luna Kage slowly unsheathed a three-pronged kunai from his sleeve. A few seconds later Kakashi shot from the stands aiming for Naruto's exposed head. Die demon, he yelled, Raikiri. His attack would have obliterated the blonde skull if a three-pronged kunai hadn't pierced his arm. Kakashi screamed in pain as he crashed to the ground. The arena was filled with gasps of shock. The looks were then replaced with looks of anger and scorn. The lunakage appeared in a yellow flash before grabbing Kakashi by the throat and ripping the kunai out of his arm. You know, if it weren't for the fact that there were probably some squeamish people in this area and I would rip off your arm and then shove it down your throat boy, the lunakage said in an obviously angry tone, but I'll go with beating you to a pulp. Naruto would you mind? Naruto smirked and was about to help his old man lay the beat down on the silver-haired hypocrite when a huge explosion rocked the ground beneath them. What the hell was that? Anko yelled as she looked up. Everyone turned to holographic projector, which gave the image of static. Then it changed to show a large ship shooting down at the city along with dropping off much smaller ships. Vilgax, Ben said as he recognized the ship. Naruto reformed his helmet and said, Finally, I'll be able to try. The lunakage lifted Kakashi and Sasuke onto his shoulders and said, I'll drop these two off at the containment block. After that I'll join you. Naruto nodded and said, Okay guys. Let's crack some skulls. Naruto and rest of the plumber's kids were instantly teleported to the spot where the ships were being dropped. Out of the ships came a few familiar figures to the plumber's kids like Dr. Onimo and the circus freaks. With them were a bunch of ANBU wearing blank masks. In the back of it all stood a large alien that looked like it had a squid on its face along with Danzo. I'm using the Vilgax from Ben 10,000 because he looked a lot cooler. 
Who are these numb skulls? Naruto asked as he mask covered his face again. They're pretty much all the enemies we've made back on Earth, Ben explained, the guy in the back is Vilgax. I can't say anything about the other guy though, Naruto snarled and said, his name is Danzo. He's one of the council advisors in my home village. He's also wanted the title of Hokage for years. Personally, I think that desire has driven him mad. Minato appeared in a flash of yellow right behind Naruto. So these are the numb skulls attacking my village, Minato scowled as he glared at the trio from behind his mask. I'll take that old damn war hawk, Minato scowled as he popped his neck, it'll give me a chance to try this out. Minato grabbed his robes before ripping it away. Underneath, the robes was a suit of high-tech black and green armor. A helmet with a blank black mask that had two dark green lines that ran up the back of the head and went down the face where the eyes and face were. On its left shoulder was the Lunagakir symbol in silver. Azimuth and Merlin make some pretty mean armor, don't they? Naruto asked. Minato flexed his hand and said, yes they do. Now let's show these bozos what we're made of. Vilgax looked out over his army and saw Chimera dressed in his armor. So that is the boy you told me about, Vilax said. He doesn't look like much. Danzo shrugged and said, the Chimera is much stronger than he looks. After you kill him then you can destroy Ben 10. Vilgax snarled, don't think you can order me human. I'll only kill him because he stands in my way. Vilgax jumped off from his stand and started running towards the battle. Danzo smirked that his plan was coming full circle. When this moon village was destroyed he would take control of this Vilgax and thus gain control of his army. He would then wipe the other hidden villages off the map. Then, with the combined might of all the power of the hidden villages under his power, it would spread to the rest of the world and then spread to other planets until the galaxy was his. When that was done, Kanoha would finally be the supreme power that it was supposed to be all those years ago. It was then that the bandaged man noticed a man in armor looking at him. The man then motioned for him to come on. Danzo grinned before he moved over to him. You must be the one in charge of this whole thing, the masked Minato said. Yes I am, Minato said, who are you supposed to be? The bandaged man said, I am Danzo Shimura, soon to be Rokadame Hokage, and eventual ruler of the world and then the galaxy. Minato scowled behind his helmet and growled, I highly doubt that you are going to wind up a leader for anything. Especially seeing as you apparently a complete and utter psycho. Danzo scoffed and said, that is no way to speak to your future master. Danzo went through some one-sided hand signs and yelled, wind style, decapitating air waves. Danzo launched waves of razor-sharp air from his mouth. The lunakage then threw out an arm, sending a wave of wind himself, separating the waves outward and sent the waves in different directions. Danzo looked surprised as his move was sent in different ways. The lunakage cocked his head to his side in a confused gesture and asked, Is that all you can do, my future master? The last part was said sarcastically. Danzo snarled. I wasn't going to use these, Danzo said, but I see that you will need to be shown your obvious betters. The man reached for the bandages on his arm and said, Now, see my power and no true fear. Danzo ripped the bandages off revealing ten Sharingan eyes. Then he ripped the bandages off his face, revealing another one in his supposed to be empty eye socket. Minato looked shocked and growled, so, I was right when I heard of an entire clan of red-eyed ninjas being killed. Have you no respect for the dead? Danzo scowled and said, this is the ultimate power. With this arm and these eyes. I will rule this world with an iron fist and no one shall be able to stop me. The disguised Minato clenched his fists as a metallic stick popped out of the armor's belt. The stick ignited forming in light green energy blade. We'll see about that ultimate power bit, Minato said as he twirled his weapon. Meanwhile, the plumber's kids were facing down against their enemies and the root ANBU. With powers were able to let them keep up with their ANBU opponents. Kevin absorbed some alien metal, keeping his body impervious to metal and jutsu. Gwen was keeping her opponents at bay with her powers. Helen was running around the ANBU and knocking them around like a bunch of pinballs. 
In all honesty, it was actually quite funny, Cooper had formed a monolith robot and was smashing his enemies around. When he wasn't throwing them around he was in a wrestling match with one of Dr. Onimo's latest creations, which looked like a cross between a rhinoceros and a gorilla. Alan's fire powers were incredibly useful for keeping his enemies at bay. Sonny was basically doing the same thing as Gwen was. Ben was currently in his diamond head form making him impervious and allowing him to knock his enemies around pretty easily. Eunice was knocking her opponents around using her weapons. She was also currently in a fight with Rojo. Manny was basically going all WWE on his opponents. The method was surprising effective since he was basically all muscle. Pierce was using the toxin in his spines that knocks his opponents. This proved useful, since he was fighting the circus freaks, especially Thumbskull, since he was such a large target. All in all it was a pretty one-sided fight, especially, since the ANBU thought the fight was going to be easy, since they were all just a bunch of kids. This proved even more difficult when the Kanoha clans joined in on the fight. After about a half hour of combat, the root were down for the count and the alien-slash-alien hybrids were tied up with energy ropes, thanks to Gwen and Sunny. You know, Ben said, normal people don't do this kind of thing. Kevin looked at the boy and said, yeah. But there is one thing I've learned over the years. Normal is boring and overrated. The kids were pulled from their thoughts as there was huge explosion. They turned to the left to see Vilgax come flying out towards them. The only difference was that Vilgax was missing an arm, bleeding furiously, and had half of his face burned off. Naruto walked out of the smoke. The armored Luna Ninja unsealed the massive energy broadsword. Hey, Naruto yelled, anybody up for a calamari? The blonde then spun on his heel. The massive green energy blade sliced through the great alien's neck and then fell to the ground. Vilgax's body fell right next to the disembodied head. Naruto chuckled and said, I ain't cleaning that up. Naruto saw the disabled group of villains in front of him and said, not bad for a bunch of rookies. I have to say I'm impressed. Shikimura nodded at the armored blonde and said, so, you really are the son of the fourth. Naruto raised an eyebrow and said, you figured it out. Shikimaru answered dully, dad told me, and you're basically a carbon copy of the guy. I guess nobody figured it out because they were too damn blind. Naruto shrugged. Everyone's attention was then attracted to the sound of a ship firing up. One of the ships that dropped off the soldiers was flying up towards Vilgax's mother ship. Minato appeared in a yellow flash and said, Sorry Naruto. A couple of those root punks snuck up on me and stole the boss away before I could finish him. By the way, I got a trophy from the old war hawk. Naruto nodded in thanks and said, Thanks pops. Now. I got something to take care of. You might want to back up. Naruto crouched down and started to growl loudly. Gwen, Kevin, and Ben all recognized the motion and moved as many as they could back. Red chakra started to flow around him and a huge crater formed where he was standing. The red chakra formed a cloak and nine large fox tails formed at the small of his back. A red spiral started appearing and focused around his mouth. His whisker marks darkened and his eyes turned red. Finally Naruto threw back his head and said, Kubiki Amari. Nine-tailed menacing ball. Naruto then threw himself forward launching a large ball of red chakra at the ship. There was a light pause as the blast hit and faded away from existence. Then a huge explosion tore through space and produced a huge shockwave that nearly knocked everyone off their feet. Naruto cracked his neck and said, Plumbers and Moon Village, 1. Evil Psychopaths, Zip. Epilogue. After things cooled down from the unprecedented attack, things got much better, almost instantly. The fire daimyo, who had witnessed the fights by a hologram projector provided by Minato, gave Lunagakir the rights to be a shinobi village. After their capture, the root ANBU committed senpuku since they were no longer able to benefit their master. The village pretty much went to Rifuarim after seeing that the plumbers had a weapon of mass destruction on their side. A lot of them actually moved to the Moon Village to work there. Against all odds Frightwig and Charmcaster wound up falling for Naruto. 
After a major catfight between them and May, they all agreed to share. The Kanoha clans joined Lunagakir as well, since it was quickly becoming a powerful village. When Naruto's heritage was released the civilian part of Kanoha wouldn't stand for it. They said it was lies and that the demon should be killed. A few beating later the stopped. The fire daimyo then removed Kanoha shinobi village status and had it made into a port for earth where people could go and offer mission in the elemental nations. Kakashi went into a deep depression after realizing that the demon he tried to kill was his sensei's son. He is currently in jail for the attempt at murder charges from the tournament. Sasuke, when going to trial, tried to gain control of the moon village by taking control of Minato's mind. This backfired horribly as the former Hokage of Kanoha proceeded to actually rip out his ad insult to injury Naruto, crystallized his foot and proceeded to smash a certain part of the arrogant Echiha's body into paste. Sasuke then had his chakra sealed away and is now under guard by the plumbers 24-7. Sakura immediately tried hunting down Minato to order him to release her true love. In the process, she almost caused an intergalactic incident since Minato was meeting an alien ambassador who had very sensitive hearing. She was taken to their planet and incarcerated right after she had her vocal cords removed. Everyone else pretty much had a good life. Naruto is currently the lunakage having three kids with Mei, Frightwig, and Charmcaster. Minato has retired and is now living in solitude watching his grandchildren while his son and daughter-in-laws are at work. Hinata tried to kill Mei upon hearing that they were dating. She failed of course and went into a slight depression. Naruto eventually got her out of it and she became the children's godmother. She soon started dating Shikimaru who became the godfather. Swanda is now the head of the medical division of the hospital. She quickly grew used to all the high tech and has been the top doctor there for quite some time. Jiraiya actually became head of the academy since Naruto threatened to castrate him when he wanted to write a book about him and his wives. He's actually quite content as a teacher with Irika helping him keep the kids under control. Everyone else lived lives as normally as they could and eventually married their sweethearts. All in all life was pretty good. End. Thanks for watching please like share and subscribe.